Oh, yeah. With Meryl Streep. I forgot about that. Oh, my God. Wait, is it the most... When the fuck did that come out? Who knows? Who... Did that come out in 2017 or... Trump was our president because I remember he slammed the movie. Um, But other than that, I don't remember. But... was Yeah, that was Tom Hanks as well. But there is... um. In terms of other directors who take actors and carry them out of their projects and still get wonderful performances out of them. Are you going to talk about Orson Welles? I'm not because uh, he's dead. Mike Lee? No. Um, I guess there's nobody else. Uh, except the director of today's film, Guillermo del Toro. Oh my God. I didn't even think of that. I know. It's so weird, right? <laughs> oh man. Yeah. He carries a lot of actors in an especially in the series of movies, one of which we're going to be talking about today on the Spectator Film Podcast. Hi, everybody. I'm Max. And I'm Austin. And today we're going to be doing the 2004 Bl- film Hellboy, Blade Blade to- directed by Guillermo oh. del Toro. So not Blade Two. I was thinking you're going to like Blade Two. He's carrying all these actors that he would work with again a lot. Oh, yeah. I, lo- I love Like Donnie uh, Yen. Does uh, he do anything else with Donnie Yen? I was going to say I loved uh, Wesley Snipes' performance in The Shape of Water. But, uh, <laughs> um, but no, I don't think he does. I can't remember Donnie Yen in any of his other movies. Um, I it's kind of disappointing in Blade Two, too, yeah. where you know he gets one interesting bit, but honestly, it lasts like two minutes. Oh, I can't think of another more recent movie where Donnie Yen is interesting no. for two minutes and then is never used no. again in the movie. <laughs> Don't even joke. I can't possibly think of a recent <laughs> franchise movie where that happens. Yeah. Not that that's that movie's greatest sin. Everyone knows what we're talking about. And if you if you're struggling to grasp for some the name of some shitty movie that Donnie Yen's been in lately, maybe you should rethink your standards for <laughs> shitty movies. <laughs> but anyway, we'll get to Rogue One eventually, everyone. Oh, you didn't you didn't have to clue it. You didn't have to set off the alarm bells for our Star Whatever. Wars stands. But anyway. We should just put all that behind us. And to focus on what we're going forward to today, which is the movie Hellboy, directed by Guillermo del Toro in the year 2004. Um, this was Your my, pick. Yeah, this was my pick. I am in a unique situation where my thought process behind picking this movie uh, for a couple of reasons. One, like everybody else on the planet, you know, the Avengers Endgame came out. It's the end of an era for superhero movies, if you're dumb is don't know that Marvel already has like 10 other movies planned coming up in the next several years. Like it's not going to go away, but it's the end of that particular chapter of the cinematic universe. Right. So comic book movies are hot and on everybody's mind. So I wanted to do, it was originally going to be a double feature, but we decided against that. So we just decided. And on, not the sequel, by the way, not the sequel. No, a completely a tease for you guys, a completely different type of comic book movie. Um, but I wanted to do a comic book movie that I thought succeeded very well in various ways, which in one way you have your source material and you stay very faithful to that. This is while borrowing from a bunch of other Hellboy comics. This is a pretty dead on telling of the Hellboy story, the seed of destruction. Okay. Um, but at the same time, getting a director with a vision who loves the property, but also wants to contribute his visual style and flair and world building to this universe. And I think Hellboy 2 is the perfect example of that. But the first one is still very good at it. And it's also relevant because there was a disastrous remake that just came out. And I know that the reboot of Hellboy was probably, as we discussed, in the works before yeah, Del Toro. Before he won for Shape of Water. For Shape of Water. Um, Not that that should have mattered, but it matters to dumbass people in suits who make creative yeah, decisions. Yeah, it's about just like, thing. oh, he's wanted to make a third one in the trilogy. Sure, let's let's put on that. We even have the same actor playing a fish man, so why not? Right, uh, we just, just everything that people like just yeah. just happened, and we can. I'm sure we can. Uh, we can whip up a Game of Thrones asshole to put them in some place in the yeah. background. Uh, and, uh, you know, it'll be great. Get get a kid from Stranger Things and you have the trifecta instead. We Stranger got- Things, Game of Thrones, Guillermo del Toro, and someone from Riverdale. <laughs> it's the 
It's a sure Fantastic fire. Four. Yeah. <laughs> His recipe for success in Hollywood. Oh my god! But the, yeah, that's a disappointment. Yeah, that was a that was a project you really wanted. Del Toro keeps having projects. We were making fun of this before we, we started were saying it should be a meme where Del Toro. It should be the meme of like Del Toro worked on such and such movie. And Not hit. even just movies though. Um, I don't know if you remember. Oh, video games. Yeah, because there was PT, which was a playable trailer for the next Silent Hill. <laughs> it could game. literally be anything. And You're, yeah. <laughs> That okay, but can I just rant about that for like five seconds? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Because that was like my dream combination of all these things coming together. You had <laughs> you had fucking Hideo Kojima, who's a legend in the video game industry. Um, you had Guillermo del Toro working on the story of that game. You had Akira Yamamoka doing the music, who did the music for all the Silent Hill games, but his soundtracks are amazing. Mm-hmm. And you had Junji Ito who is this legendary Japanese horror artist who has this amazing, distinct, disturbing style. I've actually worn buttons of his, like the girl with the spiral going back in her eye. That's his artwork. Um, Oh, I don't remember that. And all of those, show me all of those were working together on the silent Hill game that PT was leading up to. And then fucking (laughs) Konami fired him. And then the project fell apart. He is working. Del Toro is working with him on his new project. The yeah, he's in it. He's right. in it slash contributing to the writing and direction a little bit. Well, there along you go. with Mads Mikkelsen. And He's definitely a guy who is just doing everything all the time. Yeah. And I, I, I always appreciate when somebody is that excited about being creative, you know, no, and, and like, and, and just being able to like, I'm going to do whatever I can to just be creative and do interesting, fun things. And he was very passionate about Hellboy. He loved the comics and to the point where actually he was on the same kind of wavelength as the author, Mike Mignola. Yeah, um, I believe I I don't own the Blu-ray to this, but I know that on the Blu-ray, Blu-ray that they released, they do the commentary track together. Did they share screenwriting credits? To a degree, yes. Yeah. Um, when he was getting to together with him to start fleshing out what this was going to be, mm-hmm. they had a cute little moment where they were both going to say which actor they would prefer to play Hellboy. And they say both Ron Perlman? Yeah, they said Ron Perlman both at the same he, time. It is perfect casting. Um yeah, this is also an example of a movie that I'm glad that the director somehow was able to just sort of spit in the studio suit's face whenever they tried to make changes to the film. Well, do we know for sure certain changes they wanted to yes. make? Okay. Um, Maybe should we save it for the commentary or is there some that's worth mentioning right off the bat? Um, I think we can return to one of them on the commentary, but I'll okay. say it real quick which is that initially the studio was pushing for Vin Diesel to play Hellboy. <laughs> yes. Um, I forgot that already. Which we'll talk about Ron Perlman's performance in this and how he has sort of a charisma and empathetic quality. I think it his is rough anti-hero thing that could have been played terribly by a different actor. Well, this movie has fans, right? Yes. Who undoubtedly enjoy Del Toro and are like really big fans specifically of Ron Perlman in this movie. And I'm going to wager that both of us feel after our prep screening and just talking about this as we were watching it in real time, it's like, no, actually Ron Perlman is underrated in this movie. Yeah. Uh, And it's like phenomenal. So it's a mixture of the writing as well that enables him to give that performance. But like he is as good in this movie as... Vin Diesel would not be. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Um, um, just a really brief history. Not uh, that we're like against the Ds. But. Uh, yeah, just a really brief history for this. Um, I actually didn't see this in theaters. Ooh. Because uh, hilariously enough, my parents saw the trailer for this movie and they're like, that's scary. Well, no, they're like, Hellboy, really? They're just trying to be offensive now. And then uh, uh, several years later, when Hellboy 2 came out and he was uh, yeah, del toro was a slightly more prestigious director right we went to go see that and my mother to this day is still just like i really liked that hellboy 2 movie <laughs> like yeah it, because it was like a romance and then it, it was, was like, a romance and like the weird fairy tale stuff that really like sticks out in hellboy 2 like the sort yeah. of grim fairy tale things that like just uh, Hellboy Two, I think is a genuinely better movie, and I think we can both agree yeah. on that. I mean, we'll talk about that. The That's not movie, a fault sure. of this movie. No. It's just that everything blossoms in Hellboy Two. Um, well, it's also perhaps a credit to this movie. This movie establishes a lot of 
you know, it's not like Hellboy 2 was the one he really wanted to make the whole time, and then he just threw out everything he established in this one, although we do throw out, throw out one character who we both agree is not the best. Uh, the movie's better for it. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, but there's still he's still exploring a lot of that in this movie, so it's still there, and this movie does that well, but like you're saying, Hellboy 2 is the more perfected, you know, and uh, elaborate and, I, you know, um, thorough investigation of a lot of those ideas, which we're going to talk about in the track. Yes. So I just saw that this a couple of years later on DVD. I really liked it. Um, but then I saw Hellboy two and that was sort of like a thing where I'm just like, Oh, sequels can be better than the <laughs> original movie. That was, right. that's the most notable thing about it. I don't, we were listing off all of our rankings for del Toro movies. Um, this isn't one of my, all time favorites by him, but I always enjoy watching this movie. Yeah. And it has who I would argue is probably my favorite contemporary actor, Doug Jones in it. And I enjoy everything in that. like right now working. Yeah. Um, as far as working actors go, just cause I love his body acting style. I love his performances and roles he's allowed to speak in. And every interview I see with him, my heart melts and just how genuinely charming and nice of a man he seems. So, yeah, I saw him at a thing in New York once. Did I tell you this? Uh, I believe you mentioned it in passing. You didn't yeah. And he did. gives everybody hugs. Yes. But yes. it's like very conspicuous because of how like mime skeleton. He <laughs> yes. Is. Very wiry man. Yeah, it's just like, wow, that's like his hug is like his arms look like they're stretching infinitely around somebody. <laughs> uh, but yes, you know, certainly he seems like a lovely gentleman. Uh, I think some of the things you've mentioned so far about this movie are definitely things we're going to come back to oh, yes. during the commentary. And I'm glad you mentioned them now, though, because I think uh, watching this movie after you picked it in preparation for this uh, recording today, I feel like my appreciation of this movie has grown. I would agree that this is not even where, like, I wouldn't even put this maybe in the top five of my favorite of del Toro's movies, but, um, cause he doesn't have a ton, but he's made a few he's that are really a solid lot of quality movies. Yeah. Too. Or at least that I'm just like, are kind of, they can just ascend past this movie because this is still operating with this within huh. certain limitations. But I do feel like my appreciation of it has grown just this week watching it. And I feel like now I am less likely to only think of this movie in reference to, Hellboy 2 because Hellboy 2 I think is definitively better than this but um this movie is still doing things on its own that allow Hellboy 2 to take the next step and I think that's important and I really do appreciate that performance from Ron Perlman um you know we're both going to agree it's not a perfect movie and there are certain things where you can maybe sense that there are limitations in the storytelling that it can't be as risky uh, again certain characters that would go on to be cut from the second movie or are certain characters of that. that are introduced in this movie, but don't have a lot to do and then are allowed to fully form in the second film as well. Right. Um, yeah. So, you know, there are certain things like that, that it reveals its limitations, but within those, it is still doing really interesting things. It's like we were talking about with mimic, right? Yeah. Which, you know, you haven't seen, but we were talking about it beforehand. And, uh, I don't know if you'll ever be interested in watching it, but a description of, of it would be like, it is not a good movie and it's not really that interesting, but it is the, this messed up cynical studio version of a del Toro movie. You can tell that the studio still fucked a movie by Guillermo del Toro. You know what I mean? Yes. And I think no matter what the constraints are, again, Guillermo del Toro being such a uh, sort of lively creative person, I think he has like a motor um, which allows him to just imbue things with interesting ideas, even if it doesn't add up to something that's totally cohesive in, in, in its like totality. When you're running up against studio limitations, it allows movies like this that would otherwise be more by the numbers to sort of ascend past their things that are more cliche or expected. And it's like, those are neat details. And uh, it adds up to like an interesting movie in terms of its subtext and not just visuals. Um, one of the things I really like about Del Toro is that he engages in the non-superficial world building, like you yes. said. Um, and we'll define that more in the commentary track. But there are 
some ways of world building that seem to be just an excuse for not having interesting characters or plot. Del Toro never does that. In fact, he's quite good at doing world building without ever actually drawing attention to it, either in terms of camera placement and choreography or uh, dialogue or anything. You or visual see- cues, just like small little things. Right, and it's not, I think people would commonly call that an Easter egg, but it's like if it informs something about the character or the story, that's, that is world building. Yes. That's not, that's not an Easter egg. An Easter egg, I feel like, is something that's trivial and has no place. Like the devil's backbone fetus in the jar, that's an Easter egg. That's an movie. Easter, that's like, yeah. a, hey, remember I did this? But yes. Th- and that, you know, a lot of people, I think, mistake that for world building. It's like, no, world building contributes. You just never have to point it out. If that, no, if people consider that world building, it would be in a thing of just like, did you know that the devil's backbone and Hellboy take place in the same universe? Right. And with our proliferation of Marvel movies, yeah. this type of thinking, I think, you know, I'm sure you can take that sort of thing in an interesting direction. But if you're doing it in a lazy way, it's just not interesting. Del Toro is able to go past that. I don't think he's always successful. In each of his movies, I know you and I have differing opinions about some of his stuff. Yeah, we, I was um, going to bring up, we have, uh, not drastically, but very different opinions on a Pacific Rim. Right, in or at least we we ha- we sort of agree about what it's doing. It's just, I, I think it's a matter don't of enjoy taste. that yeah. as much. Yeah, um, and you know, I think that's one of the great things about this too, it being s- such a pulpy adventure. It's able to draw from so many different texts and incorporate them and sort of, uh, but the, the key part of it is that it incorporates everything into like an ideological and emotional examination. He is committed to understanding the mindset of these characters and uh, the world they live in, and that makes all the difference. He's not getting bogged down in minutia like a Wes Anderson, where it's just like you just spent 40 minutes choosing every single one of those board games in that cabinet, and it means nothing. <laughs> And it annoys me that you spent you spent forty minutes doing that instead of forty minutes making your fucking script more interesting, Wes. What are you doing? <laughs> this is a call out. Yeah, Wes, you've been fucking called out. We only call out directors with the last name Anderson, and it's either to shit on them uh, about their obsessive minutia or threaten to suck their dick. So <laughs> you can't let that go, can you? What? We're going to need to revisit that when the Monster Hunter movie finally comes out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know where to go from that. I'll but be letting, <laughs> letting him know if he's going to get a game dick suck. Should send him a, like, a letter <laughs> with like thick wax stamped on it with like a big seal that's just like a penis. <laughs> Jesus Christ. We're always this stupid. I can't even remember what podcast that was on. That was uh, Sam Neill. Oh, Event Horizon? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go listen to our Event Horizon podcast if you want the, the hell, yeah, hideous backstory on that joke. Yeah, oh. which how could you not? <laughs> you got to keep bringing it up because that's the ultimate, like, you know how in when you're first learning to write stories in kindergarten, they're like, start your story with a exciting action or yeah. like a bam moment or a hook. That us saying that is the hook. <laughs> okay. The lure nobody can resist. Least of all, Paul W.S. Anderson. So uh, I don't know what to say <laughs> now, Christ. but I guess it's time to start the movie. We've fallen pretty far, but I don't think we've, <laughs> quite, hit, don't think we've quite hit hell yet, so let's go there. Yeah, all right. Oh, that's loud. Oh, that's way too loud. Austin... I always forget to do that. I'm sorry. We've started the movie, by the way. Hopefully that's clear. You can tell by the very loud Columbia music that's <laughs> blaring in the background. You know, there was once a conspiracy theory that the Columbia woman for a certain part of the 90s was actually Annette Benning. Fun fact for you. Cool. Riveting start to this Hellboy commentary. <laughs> Annette Benning's great, though. She's a good actor. Anyway, so uh, here we are. We're watching Hellboy. What a strong start. Yeah. yeah talking about a net bending so but we start we start off with what could be annoying of the you used to have this a lot the blah 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 the blah blah blah, blah, blah title at the beginning but this also kind of sets up like the mixing of mythologies that is one of the aspects of not just the hellboy comics but also this movie that i really enjoy right um where 
I we love- assume it's endemic to the Hellboy comics. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I've read a lot of the Hellboy comics. So I should probably say that, that. Yeah. I'm a big fan of yeah Mike Mignola's work. But I love the world idea. It's used a lot in fantasy worlds, but I love it in real life or things that are supposed to be set in like the real world um, where it's just like what religion is right. Yes. Every, every culture, every thing, every deity, every yeah, myth. Yes, it exists. And it's a matter of what affects what and how it works. Or at least like there's a greater cosmic sort of uh, structure that we access through religion. Yeah. But it's not at the exclusion of one religion versus of another. You know, it's a, an, an interesting movie that is kind of similar to this, um, which came out the same year that I remember that from, uh, is Van Helsing. Yeah. Where he goes to workshop underneath the Vatican, but you see like imams and stuff working on like holy hand grenades or whatever. Uh, well, we get a, a, we get a good moment. Well, yeah, that's the, that's the other interesting this. thing. Well, which the whole thing of just like him handing, like, I'm going to give your men these crosses to ward off these certain kind of demons. And it's like, oh, are you a Catholic? It's like, yeah, but that's not the point. Right. Of this. Right. We were talking about this, how that line, it's not the point is important because yeah. it's not the Catholicism itself. That's important. It's a certain type of spirituality that is more important or something that is, again, in that scene, very, very explicitly opposed to the idea of the gun. So you have a certain type of materialism on one hand, and then you have the spiritualism on one hand. But the spiritualism is dangerous because, or at least it's ambiguous in its nature, because while it's the tool that he's going to use to try to protect these people, right? Uh, and in, in that sense, maybe this movie is giving it superior power or authority over like materialism in its more basic form. It's also the reason the Nazis are here and they will weaponize it against yeah. you. Uh, so it's an ambiguous thing. It, there's no, there's nothing about it that is inherently safe either in, in which in certain movies that are more generic, somebody might turn to like a Christian theology that is underpinning the subtext of that movie. And it's, taken for granted that is an instantly safe thing. This movie is interesting because in the way it introduces Broom and all these soldiers, it definitely creates a parallel between that type of Catholicism and the reason the Nazis are here. And like you said, it is more specific than either of those things. It's a type of spirituality, I guess, um, or well, ideology. Yeah, and it's like right here, I'm going to, slide past the, if you're in a covert operation in the middle of allied territory, you probably shouldn't have big Nazi banners, but it's, it's a, pulp, it's pulp science fiction. Yeah. Yeah. It's very Indiana Jonesy. Um, yeah. And it play it steers into that in a way that's good. We would both agree on that. Yes. But, um, we have the mixing of the Nazi obsession with the occult and the mysterious, which was a popular thing for some reason among Nazis during world war two era. We introduce fucking Grigori Rasputin. <laughs> right. In terms of things, but like you have this like two very different things of Catholicism and then the thing that he's trying to tap into is very Lovecraftian old god right tentacle monsters. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to say Cthulhu, but like you know, stuff like that. I, I didn't prepare any direct quotes, but I found a different interesting book about it. And some people have described the way Del Toro works in this fashion. Essentially what he's doing is he's working with like, he's very strongly working with intertextuality in the sense that, you know, a lot of what he draws uh, as, as resources for like the subtext and just imagery and plots of his movies are things that he's directly repurposing from other things that he's engaged with, whether they're books, paintings, movies, et cetera, et cetera, right? We all know his persona on the internet. He is the historian fanboy, right? Yeah. And his movies reflect that in a very strong way. And that's why he seems sort of like a, a perfect match for Hellboy because that's something that is, again, doing the alternate history, pulp science fiction. It's taking from different cultural histories and, and mixing it together in a melting pot. And uh, some directors do that more than others who work in genres. Some do it in a way that isn't controlled and aware. And others, like Del Toro, um, try to just pack in as many details as they can. And others, similar to Del, to Del Toro, do it purposefully, but they aren't really always successful in actually having it mean something to the, to the story being told at hand. Yeah. Whereas Del Toro, I think, again, one of the things we were talking about with the world being not, world building not being superficial 
is that he does find a way to have it make a point frequently. Yeah, which it's is not why just it there works. for the sake of being there. Yeah, that's why it works. Um, that's why it's not annoying. Oh God, oh God, the best boy is going to have to go after that. It's very glad that they prepared to have such long cords so we can get this cool little shot of the old, yeah, the old one or the terrifying being from another dimension. God, it would be awful if you were the intern who had to go after that. <laughs> but yes, uh, that is certainly a central feature of his movies. And I, it, like I was saying, some people have referred to it as a monster mash. Yeah. Where he slams a lot of things together, even though that terminology, I think, is doesn't quite get at the nuance always in how he Honestly, does it. Honestly, if we want to... I know this probably wasn't the intent of that quote. Yeah. But if we want to go into that, because the song, Monster Mash <laughs> itself, it's a very humanizing song for monsters. It's them getting together on Halloween. Sure. And having a dance party and having a grand old time, something that humans would do. And a common theme that we're going to be talking about through this movie in particular is the humanization of monsters and the other. But also, oh. even that is like, Oh, by the way, should we pause to say that th this is maybe one of the few actually clever uses of the Wilhelm scream? Yeah. Because that I bet that German soldier is actually named Wilhelm. <laughs> it could be also, like it, like we said, it's very Indiana Jonesy. so like, yeah. I, I'm okay with it. Not a lot of people will actually fucking n understand that, but if you do know it, you know what type of th movie this is. You get the Wilhelm scream, you get pulp science fiction, you get striking imagery, uh... Yeah, this movie sets up its tone really well in this opening scene. Um, but what were we saying? Oh, sorry, so not, you, Nazi with Blade. Well, you were talking about you. like the humanizing of other monsters, or yes. just playing with this idea of monstrosity, and that's certainly a central feature of a lot of his movies. Um, they deal with monsters and the idea of othering and all that sort of thing. Uh, that's a core tenet of a lot of his movies, and I think often, you know the paradigm that he ends up going with is something we're very used to. It's very much, we're very used to this idea of the other, they're not so different after all. Yeah. And although I think you could watch this movie and get that from it, I think if you really pay attention, it's doing something slightly more interesting, at least in this one. And I think more so in the second one, which is why that one really hits home. But in this one, it's less like, oh, they're just like us and more like, you know, it, it says more about how people relate to a greater ideology, both us and them. You know what I'm saying? It's like normal people, quote unquote normal people, are as much subject to the same things that these people have to deal with, only it's to a lesser degree. Yes. You know? In that sense, it seems very much about privilege in an interesting way. Oh, God, there he goes. Don't worry, you can't kill Rasputin. We well, all know that. That cat really was gone. <laughs> dun, dun. But we yeah. should we should just play that instead of our normal intro music because Boney M's Rasputin. <laughs> you know, I was thinking of uh, setting up some impromptu karaoke. <laughs> Surprise you, I could not find any good karaoke tracks. You think that would be one that people would be like, that's a great karaoke? No. I feel like uh, now, all the ones I found were just like lame. I found one that was just like marimbas. Uh, I'm like, this sucks. I, I <laughs> that song kind of had its own meme moment, so I'm sure like there's something you could find. Oh, with like, like air horns? No, just just air horn. Just raw raw Rasputin. Um, I can't remember the first time I saw that, but it was popular on Tumblr for a couple of years, <laughs> for at least a year. Um, well, anyway, so, so what now, we're talking about though with the humanity stuff. We didn't mention it, but that opening narration by John Hurt, yeah, 100%, that's what that's about, is you know talking about this idea of the legitimate identity, the legitimate person, what makes a man a man. A a man. man. Yes. It was, does he have greatness inside him from wherever, or does he find it in the woods? Or <laughs> is he, you know, they, they, it's all the same thing, right? Uh, very fundamental storytelling idea, but I think Del Toro... It's different in movies like this because, you know, he he's committed to it emotionally, you know, and he, he takes something that could be a platitude and makes it gives it a little bit more life. It's interesting to watch. We are talking about uh, <laughs> this young version of the character. Oh, yes. And how uh, he reminds us a lot of uh, Herbert West from Reanimator. <laughs> Jeffrey Combs. Like 
he's just he's just doing a Jeffrey Combs impression. This yeah. actor, I don't know if I've seen this actor in anything else. I'm not sure his name off the top of my head, but it's just he's doing Jeffrey Combs. And uh, to be honest with you, I do wish, despite the weird age thing of Jeffrey Combs' age at when this movie was made, I wish they had just found Jeffrey Combs. What was else was Jeffrey Combs doing at the moment? You know, I'm sure it's surprising that uh, he hasn't worked with Jeffrey Combs already. Yeah, I he feel totally like could have. Reanimator yeah. does seem like right up his alley, honestly. Well, um, just all the Jeffrey Combs shit that he's done. Yeah. The Edgar Allan Poe performances and all that stuff. It's no, a red it's not, ape. It's not an ape. It's a demon. It's fine. I was mentioning before all the little noises that Baby Hellboy is making were uh, done by Del Toro himself. Best line in the movie, by the way. Did what? you see that? Look at the size of that whammer. <laughs> <laughs> this is how people talked in the 40s. Yeah. Oh, there's the baby Ruth. Now, we were going back and forth. Let us know in the comment section, folks. Is this a reference to the Goonies? I don't think so, because yet again, it was in the comics. Um, but it was he referencing the Goonies? I mean, it could be, or he was just choosing a candy bar. Um, yeah. Well, they fucked up. It should have been Snickers, because as we all know, you're not you when you're not hungry. Uh, I don't know. I like Babe Ruth's much better than Snickers, but that's just me. Well, Max, here's the thing. When you say stuff like that, they have to give you money. You just fucked it up. Well, no. We were f- close to getting our first donation to the goddamn Patreon, the first member, it was going to be Snickers. And then you just shat all over this fruit basket we gave them. Snickers doesn't even sponsor us. They just throw us Not a even buck. good as... They throw, like, us a, they throw us a buck a month on Patreon. <laughs> yeah. But like, yeah, seriously... We, you we just, are not sponsored by either candy bar company. Um, and that's a damn shame. Yes, I wonder if this movie did get royalties for that, though. Um, or are you just advertising money? I'm sure... They did. I mean, I don't know. But yes, so I am completely spacing on what we were talking about. We were talking about the classic form. Yeah. Yeah. We're in peak form today. Uh, No, yeah. The othering is something that I think is established well in this prologue. And it's really the interesting thing with the othering is when we see it actually on the face of Ron Perlman in that performance. Because we're going to point it out almost so rapidly that it'll be hard to like pause and point it out as it's happening. Yeah. But I think the, one of the real things that we both learned or realized about this movie is truly how much space Ron Perlman has to uh, suggest different ideas in within his performance as given by the script. Um, One of the interesting things we didn't talk about is how this movie uh, sets itself up as a sort of, more standard movie and then immediately departs from those things. It uh, tries to grab you with just like, you know what kind of movie this is. So yeah. just sit back and enjoy it. And then it instantly turns into a Guillermo del Toro movie. Right. Which, but also the thing I appreciate about that is that it doesn't even really pay attention to the fact that it's subverting expectations. No, it's not reveling in that. It's yeah. just like, this is the way the movie is going. Now. In fact, it's not even, it's not even that it's not revel. It's like, doesn't even notice. Yeah. Like and so for some movies, when they subvert your expectations, um, at least in my expect my experience, sometimes it works to really focus on the fact that the audience didn't think this beforehand or going into it. And other times, it just seems like you're cheapening the moment because it seems like you're more after shocking me than actually. Yeah, and after the initial you know, like, and after the initial like, I can't believe you just did that war off. You're just like. Oh, but that is that of, really as impactful as it could have been? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but again, one of the great things is that Del Toro is nothing if not a sincere filmmaker and he is committed to these characters. It's clear that he loves this source material. Um, and I don't say that in the way where he is indulgent either. That's something that could definitely happen. It's clear that Peter Jackson loves the Hobbit, yes. but in a bad way. You know what I'm saying? Well, I don't know. I think the Hobbit, I think is a, kind of an example of like somebody who actually loves the source material, but didn't want to make that movie. And then was like dragged to by a studio after years. But cause like I, yeah, I, 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 re- I rewatched all three Lord of the Rings movies recently. And like there are passion in those movies. Like you can tell he loves the source material. And also they had no idea what the fuck they were doing as they started. Yeah. Which is the amazing thing. Also bad move by this guy. It's just a bad move. Yeah. Don't take somebody into the place you think is cursed in the middle of nowhere without accepting payment first, at least. 
and they're going to offer you gold. Yes. Nazi gold. Uh, yeah. So, um, in terms of talking about like, sort of, what the fuck were we just talking about? We were talking about Del Toro and how he's a sincere filmmaker. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry. Are so, you high? Like, <laughs> I don't know. I just have no clue what's going on. You know, it's just, I'm just right. dying. It is what it is. But, uh, yeah, so he's very sincere filmmaker and he's committed to this stuff. So that's why it's interesting. Um, and that's why the subversions, even as they're happening, the movie's more focused on transforming into something else instead of peacocking for you. That it's like, this isn't what you thought it was. Um, but again, that transformation, I think, is embodied by this, by like Myers and the movie's attitude towards him and how that changes so abruptly. I couldn't find anything about Myers. I tried to do some research. He doesn't exist in the comics, does he? No, he he does not exist in the comics. Um, You do have, like, side human characters that interact with Hellboy, but, like, none of them are really expanded on that much, and it's much more about his relationship with, well, this character in Seed of Destruction, but this character does die even even quicker in Seed of Destruction than he does in the movie. Mm -hmm. Um, But with other characters, other people at the Bureau. Myers is not, no, he's not important, but I I found a lot of interesting things that the studio tried to interfere with and failed miserably to try to. I couldn't find confirmation of this, but I feel like Myers... It really feels like... Yeah, yeah. uh, the character of Myers really feels like the studio being like, listen, we need something for the average person to connect to. We this need, movie has to be for everybody. We need an average Joe yeah. to come in and be introduced to this world so you can introduce the audience to the world at this time. And he looks needs to look like a mannequin. <laughs> and and have no memorable traits whatsoever. The most boring white man you've ever seen. Uh, yeah. By the way, this scene is way more traumatizing now for weird reasons. Uh, just where Jeffrey Tambor... Noted asshole, Jeffrey Tambor. Let's just get that out of the way. We know he's an asshole, yes. Is he? I didn't know anything about him. He's an abusive asshole oh, okay. who uh, abused people on the set of, uh, what's that show? Arrested Development? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, huge asshole. Uh, but yes. So, and then he's just doing that specific thing. The interesting thing about that, though, is, is how that plays now. It's not like that, that was necessarily any less true in 2004, but it just, you know, this is something I've felt a lot about with the Trump presidency, where it's like, this is not necessarily more or less apocalyptic seeming, only that now it feels like it's happening to white America. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like people have been fucking I mean, gaslighting po- marginalized communities forever. I mean, this was post-Patriot Act. Like this. Yeah, so it's still yeah. getting there. Um, but again, the interesting thing about that is the weird authoritarianism of the U.S. in this movie. And in this image, we were both talking about like, we know these are the good guys going into this. And this is definitely something I felt as a kid. I'm like, I know the movie is, I'm supposed to think these are the good guys, but watching it now, it's like this image where he's walking into this huge building and the guy's like, you're late. That's it's ominous. Well, it's a Kafka esque bureaucracy. That's like insane, you know? And when you combine that with the, the connections to the Nazis at the beginning and more specifically the spirituality of the Nazis and that link between these two things, it creates a level of discomfort with the supposed good guys that is it's effortless. You know what I mean? It doesn't go out of its way to show it to you. It's just, this is the way this is. And it makes a, a strong point, I think over the course of the movie about the culpability of this government and this system, uh, in, in maintaining the mon- monstrous identity of these people, which the second movie expands upon. Yes. Even more so. Um, but, well, yeah, we have the introduction of Abraham Sapien as, um, and I guess Myers, who yeah, he's there. So yeah, Myers, he, I guess <laughs> he's there so that the audience can be like, oh look, it's the normal Joe. But yeah. Also, this is similar. This scene in particular, and a lot of the themes this movie tackles with is similar to another movie we've done on the podcast. Yeah, before. Men in Black. Yes. Um, very. Don't, I don't know what. Maybe it. There are two possibilities. We are somehow choosing movies that we find Nazi authoritarian things in. Or we're or, paranoid and everything is Nazis now. <laughs> yes. Like, I don't feel like this movie is so much about Nazis at all. No, it's not. You. It's this was not even at the beginning, really. No, it's it's India. I, I already made the Indiana Jones comparison. Yeah. But it's like Indiana Jones level of thinking of like Nazis are bad guys. We are using the Nazis as the thing. 
Right. Yeah. And it, but what the tool of this movie is like, it uses the Nazis as starting point to begin with the enemies because it's like, it establishes them as the ultimate evil. But when yeah. it creates the link between them and the good guys, it's saying you're not safe from the ultimate evil. You know what I mean? There's a continuum between you and the ultimate evil. They're not over there. They're not someplace else. They're not irrevocably like different from you. Uh, and that's the same point it's going to make about our monstrous heroes too. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely something this movie really plays with. And you see that just in the treatment of Myers. I mean, we've been making jokes about it, but he, he frequently, even though he's the like exposition module for the audience, you know, the movie doesn't over rely on that. Oh, I found two things about that scene. One, what? yes, that's a reference Devil's Backbone. Devil's reference, backbone. Yeah. Also, that Spear of Long Gius, um, apparently that's an exact replica of what people consider to be the actual spear. <laughs> what, like the Spear of Destiny or yeah. whatever the fuck? Yeah. Which is being, it's held in some I wonder if Catholic Guillermo del Toro somewhere. almost directed Constantine. Yeah, well, that's that's another, like, comic book thing. Yeah, I'm sure he did almost direct it. Sure, why not? Yeah. Any movie. Oh, I, I, that's such a cute little... Oh, the secret, the alternate history? Yeah. Well, that's the other interesting thing, too, right? Is, like, in terms of looking at Myers as a character who clearly, I think, now this place is privileged to me. I haven't watched this movie in a long time. I watched it for the first time in the theater when it's like, fucking two or whatever the fuck. I wasn't two, but I was young. I was, I was. Austin is 12 years old. I was eight when I saw this movie. And, uh, you know, I was definitely more prepared to, to be like, oh, this is our hero. This is Myers. Right. Uh, but watching it now, it's definitely something where it's like, no, this is about his privilege. And I think the cultural history is important to that because he's just completely oblivious to these people's lives. He doesn't even know the great struggle in history that these people were going through on his behalf. Yeah. And he's trying to correct the guy who literally lived through it and was there. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, Oh no, Hitler died in 54. Oh, you mean 45? Uh, you mean 45, right? Also, he's your boss. You're going to you. fucking pedantically correct your boss. I know it's maybe different with the history of world war two, but just think about that. For, I wouldn't do that to my boss. And this is a fun touch too, in terms of, uh, this movie, which we had Mike McNola do original artwork for all of those comic books. That's pretty cool. Um, but again, he works it into the story. Yeah. What does Hellboy say? They always get the eyes wrong. We've talked about this constantly. Eyes are one of the best images and metaphors to use in terms of just honing in on a character's personality and agency and subjectivity. The eyes are the window to the soul, right? That's the idea. You can, Eyes represent a person more so than just their body. Yes. But when he says they always get the eyes wrong, he's pointing out that, oh, the people who monetize him or whatever, mainstream culture always gets something wrong about him and its bodily difference. And if you look at the covers, um, he's very thin, small eyes, which means beady and distrustful. And sure. You don't know what they're thinking as opposed to the fact that you can very well see Ron Perlman's eyes in this movie. And yes. And he's quite expressive. Yes, actually. But even aside from that, it's the whole thing of like, you know, as with most monsters throughout film history, Because they are always bodily different, it allows for the subtext of how we engage with the quote-unquote other, capital O, to rise to the surface. And that's something that a lot of monster movies really get into. And I think the interesting thing about this movie, and you've compared it already to uh, Men in Black, or did you say the title? Yeah, Yeah, Men in Black, which we both agreed was like very much, in retrospect, something that is perhaps oblivious to its own racism, And, like, endorsement of authoritarianism in a way that's fucking creepy. Yeah, some sort of weird libertarian, authoritarian... uh, Like, Iranian, like, fucking fetish dream or whatever with Tommy Lee Jones's like, face. Jesus. Where this is the sort of the opposite of that. Yeah. Here's a a little bit of... This is the exception. This is the the Machen Library. I assume that's reference to Arthur Machen. Could be. Yeah. But at any rate, we see this play a role all throughout the movie. Uh, Hellboy is introduced. You know that he's supposed to be the gruff character who's kind of brusque and tried to do things his own way, right? But because of that, the expectation is that 
he does that at the expense of the team, right? He does yeah. that at the expense of other people. I'm the lone wolf. I do what I want. Fuck the rules. But no, like he's good at his job and yes. he does it. He does it by the books while he's like on the job. It's so weird because it's not just that it subverts it. It's that in my memory, having watched this movie, and again, it's not like this in the theater was the only time I watched this movie. In my memory, I remembered him as that brusque character. And yeah. I watched it this week and it's like, he fucking does nothing to earn that. He's introduced in shadows and he talks in a deep voice and he smokes a cigar and he, he is, uh, he is kind of reveling in how much he's making Myers uncomfortable, but like, that's just sort of him learning how to deal. I don't, I don't even know how much he's doing that so much. I, when I see his performance, I'm like the movie wants is like almost setting up. You, you expect it to be like a buddy cop thing. Yeah. Where he's like tough and, you know, grizzled as we're saying and Myers is the green guy who's by the book yeah. right and the movie is sort of if you really watch the performance and just listen to what he's saying listen to the lines he's saying from the script he does nothing like that uh, it's all based on how he's lit and like this expectation of difference you know what I mean and it's not like you know calling you out for being like biased against fucking Hellboy because he's red or like different looking yeah. than you. But what it's saying is that like somehow the expectation of him being coded f for like different appears so much more profoundly subverted when it doesn't really make a point of showing you that he's not like that at all, but just kind of tricks you into maybe feeling that he is. But when you really look at it, he's very sensitive and playful yeah. And, and just like comfortable with himself, it feels like. Maybe not comfortable with himself. But he knows he, he, he like he knows what's going on with this new recruit. Like he, he gets the idea. Like, yeah. And that's why we were talking about this. We both agreed that in terms of this performance, this reminds us maybe surprisingly enough, a lot of uh Sidney Poitier in in the heat of the night. Yeah, kind of. Where he is the most qualified at his job and he you know, he doesn't let people fucking use him as a doormat constantly, right? But he understands the way people are going to treat him, but he takes it as a fact of the world and then still tries to find his own answers for himself within that structure. And it's really interesting. And it the more surprising thing about that is how well I think, like, Perlman's performance supports that. And, and it is hard to be like super expressive under that much makeup, yeah, and, like prosthetics, and he still manages to pull it off amazingly. And like I know, after Hellboy two, he said he had to take a year or two break away from the movies, right? Because he just couldn't deal with getting up at like four o'clock in the morning to have all that makeup, right? Although Doug Jones had it worse. <laughs> um, I believe Doug Jones for this movie had to sit through seven hours of makeup and then an additional three to take it off. It's always more than you think it'd be yeah. as, as much as you're like, and then Tim Curry is like sitting in the corner is like, shut the fuck up. Both of you. <laughs> Have you seen legend? Have you seen it? Uh, but again, okay. Talking about Hellboy and the nuances of his character. This is a great example of that where you have the guy who's like, Oh, the quippy, you know, super confident hero guy. Right who's just totally used to this and he's jaded. So he's talking yeah. to the bad guy who's just a monster. But then we started thinking about it and we started unpacking the scene. We're like, this is t taking place in a museum, which is again, we're going to talk about marginalized spaces in this movie, but this is an inherently white sort of colonial uh, mainstream space, right? It's a space that emphasizes otherness, but in a way that's sterile and safe and uh, sort of, I guess fetishized in terms of these objects being appropriated from other places, frequently yeah. stolen too, literally misappropriated, but it's putting it in a safe space for like the white mainstream culture. Right. And this is where we have our seed. monstrous hero seed of destruction. Yeah. Like deal with the other monstrous antagonist. Yeah. Sorry. No, that was a cute little reference to the comic that this movie is based on. Oh, where he says when he's listing off the titles, of this thing he slips in seed of destruction before Samael is the seed of destruction. Yeah. It's one of the titles. Well, no, just like he's listing off titles. He doesn't get to finish seed of destruction, but that's a cute little reference. I didn't notice that the first time. Oh, uh, 
Seed of Destruction was, yeah, in the comics it refers to whatever being, I don't think it's Semiel, but it's some sort of similar, like, weird tentacly monster that Rasputin creates. Um, anyway, but also Hellboy, it's also the Seed of Destruction. Yeah, so it, imag- I imagine yeah. it's a type of origin story in that yeah. sense. But, like, the interesting thing about having it be in this location is when you really break down the conversation he's having with Semiel and really pay attention to the delivery that he's giving. It's like, Oh my God, he's not doing it in a quippy sarcastic way. The way you think it is while you're watching it as a kid. It's like, no, he's actually trying to have a type of conversation with this thing. Yeah. He's hoping that like, it's almost, it's almost like he's lonely and he every time he try goes after these people, you know, you can read into Abe's comment about him wanting to do it by himself. He's because, a lone hero. Yeah, yeah. It's maybe it's less because he has this grandiose image of himself as a lone hero, but more because it's personal for him, and he is like trying to make a connection with these things. Well, he knows he's a monster that like is working in the world of humans rather than against them. So, right. Like, he knows it's possible. So like you're trying to get those people with you. And certainly that's something that is uncomfortable for him. You know, that's a big part of his identity is trying to exist, trying to square like his existence and how he's supposed to exist in this society that, you know, he, he helps protect from things that are monstrous like himself, right. And other like himself, but also the fact that he cannot be allowed into the mainstream spaces, you know, and, and his identity can never adapt fully to those spaces and be allowed to participate in the same way. Um, and you know, God, that, that just, that scene is like so weirdly sad too, yeah. where like the moment you really key on in on that performance, it adds so much. It's like, you know, that he, the brusqueness comes back because he knows that the guy's not the fucking monster dog is not going to talk back <laughs> to him. Right. But he's still talking to him anyway. And he doesn't go after him until Samuel starts oh, being crazy. Okay. Just a quick little thing. That dragon costume, the Oh, I didn't even see it. it. It was a really quick thing that was Del Toro inside of the dragon costume. Oh, I know uh, Mike Mignola is also somewhere in that crowd, but I don't know enough of what he looks like to point him out instantly. Yeah, but we missed Del Toro. He was there for just a split second. Yeah. Crazy costumes, huh? Uh-huh. Well, that line, too, is not just a throwaway joke still. Yeah. It's Halloween night, right? Which is maybe one of the only environments in which... By the way, this we talk, this is not a Manhattan road. Where is this? If you've ever driven in New York, the fact that they're moving over five miles per hour is honestly astonishing. Max, look at the motion blur on those things. It's nuts. They got to be at least going at least a thousand miles an hour. (laughs) Uh, but again, they break into the public space in a Halloween street fair thing. Yeah. Right. And notice that it's Myers who is the one that tries to reassert normalcy by writing off their appearances as costumes. Well, cause nobody has told him what his fucking job is yet. He just kind of like, they're just like, okay, you, you're Hellboy's assistant now. And he's like, I guess I'm supposed to support him on this. And, but also in the way he does, it reveals again, it hits home like this weird idea of like a privilege. He's a privileged character. Yeah. And again, he is the one who tr- he feels the need to be like crazy costumes, yeah. you know, not Hellboy or anybody else. Let's keep things normal. Let's keep things the way they're supposed to be. And then he just makes himself a fucking useless burden. Yeah. Like some stupid asshole. Uh, And then Hellboy, of course, because he's not actually the gruff cop who doesn't care about other people, still comes to his defense and still is not condescending to him. Yeah. You know? he like He's genuinely passionate about him. Fun fact. Ron Perlman broke a rib filming this scene. Ow. The train was moving like, I want to say like 40 miles per hour or something like that. That, What? That sounds way too fast. (laughs) When he dumps onto it that way? I I believe it's it's one of the subway fight scenes. I know he broke a rib filming. Oh, Um, God. And see, he's still, no matter how much he's trying to help. That one's a little bit more blatant. But it's very sophisticated, I think, in the scenes where he's talking to Meyer still, because it's like, it's so weird for me to describe this, where it's literally embodying the, like, what you'd expect from the, like, rough, maybe anti-hero, like, you know, buddy cop thing. Yeah. The 
the reason I emphasize the buddy cop thing is because with that, it's like the paradigm is that both characters are at fault somehow, or they're too much. They are too much an embodiment of their character traits that are their skills. It makes them interesting. So it becomes an Achilles heel, right? They're too brash, right? Or they're too by the books, but by the end, they both learn from each other. Yeah. Like what we were, well, we were complaining about men in black for not having that, but that was kind of because it would have bettered the movie because the movie set up for that. Yes. And then didn't deliver the character development part of that. Even if it would have been like basic, it wouldn't have been like a wholesale, like, abandonment to authoritarianism and surveillance capitalism. (laughs) And even beyond that, like if you set up the first part of that and then don't deliver like character growth for both of them by the end of it, right. It's just kind of bad screenwriting. Whereas this, I don't really think it gives much character growth for Myers or something, but the interesting thing in retrospect is how on a script level, all the lines fit that those check marks for, for Ron Perlman being the buddy cop partner who is too much his character and in the wrong because of that. But when you watch it, you're like, no, he's not in the wrong at all. In fact, he, he doesn't really behave brusquely whatsoever. Yeah, completely. Um, he always maintains an awareness of the public safety and responsibility for his behavior. I mean, maybe punching the cars a little bit much, but you saw how fast those things were going. Yeah. Yeah. 70 miles per hour down a regular street. Yeah. So, that moment, that scene, the first fight scene, I think for me watching it this week was a huge flip in terms of how I was looking at this performance and it totally changed everything. And I just, now when I watch the movie, I just feel like he's just a mellow guy who is just trying to figure things out, you know, and he's not trying to hurt anyone else, you know? I bet. Yeah. That's, is that Doug Jones? That's Doug Jones, the first yeah, guy in the line. The one who looks like uh, <laughs> like an alien. Ryan from whose line is it anyway? <laughs> oh my god. I love that show so much. Um anyway, we have Selma Blair. Welcome yes. back to the podcast, Sel- Selma Blair. Yes. Um as I've I mentioned before, there are characters in this movie that yeah. aren't given a whole lot to do. Unfortunately, that is Liz in this movie. Um She's a big character in the comics. Um, later on, yes. Um, actually, funnily enough, Mike, uh, Mike Mignola himself didn't know what to do with her in the oh, comics okay. for a bit. So he was going to kill her off. There's like this whole thing where there's like this golem character that ends up joining the BRPD and is born because of her firepower Okay, and steals it from her and she slowly dies because of that. And then, um, his editor was so terrified, like that he was going to kill off. Liz in the comics that he eventually talked him out of it. Yeah. And then yes, she got expanded upon much more later on. They have less of an over, like the romance between them isn't like the central focus in the comic books as it is in the movies. Um, And and I do appreciate despite the way they embrace it in this movie, they still manage to maintain a level of, they don't commit to it in in the most stupid way. Yeah. It's not like the end goal of the movie. It's not just like, well, we need to, yeah, save the world, but also get the girl. It's more of just like, yeah, I want to get the girl, but that's all sort of a part of my thing of like, I want to fit in with the normal society. I want to be part of that. And Liz is like a nice little halfway point between those. She's obviously part of the other. She's yeah. As we'll see later, she does get a few moments, but I would agree that she's yeah. kind of limited in this movie. Unfortunately, yeah. one thing I didn't even realize yesterday too, about Abe. Yeah. That's interesting. In, in just a conception of his character and his ability to do this specifically. I just realized it now while you were talking because Jeffrey Tambor yelled at him and called him fish stick yeah. while he was picking up the stuff, even though he's far more prepared to do this than literally any other human on earth. Um, yeah, fuck your forensics. <laughs> <laughs> but like, so the interesting thing about Abe, right? He also is the monstrous hero and yeah. everything we're saying about Hellboy holds true for him as well. He's othered on the basis of physical difference. But also, we're witnessing right now what that allows him to do. And even more specifically, it's interesting because he can do this through interacting with objects. So he's, he's interacting with these sort of cultural objects, and it's like he has access to a hidden history in all these items, potentially. Yeah. And that's also an interesting thing in terms of cultural identity, where like Abe is a character who can ostensibly 
interact with objects or people or certain things. And he has access to, again, that hidden history that somebody like Broom, despite being the historian and scholar, could never access. And having lived through all of this stuff. Yes. He lived through the paranormal wars. He saw the death of Hitler in 1958. Yeah. (laughs) And that's interesting. I just noticed that, you know? This is what I'm talking about. And and we talked about also, should we just pause to say like, yeah, okay. If I'm going to deconstruct this scene, there's this one. is a nitpick, but they should have fired first. We, we, <laughs> yes. We've already seen that this character, if he is affected by bullets, it's very limited. You don't have to establish it again. Is yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. Um, so like, yeah, have that scene take place first. Yeah. And then have him not do anything. You could maybe even fix it entirely with editing. Although yeah. those two guys are on the floor. But the point of the shot is to make it like it's also a demonstration of how badass he is too. Yeah, he can deflect bullets. He can deflect bullets back and kill people that way. You can kill a bunch of armed security guards. And also, importantly, enforcing the importance of uh, our heroes because the normal authorities have no power to stop these people whatsoever. Um, And then yes, we have we have girl her her amazing. Well, uh, do you know her name? That's another interesting thing. No, she has a name. Which Do you was know what it is? Not off the top of my head. It's been a while since I read Cedar Destruction. How, how about you guess? What would you say is a name for somebody who's like... Is it Fritz? From the SS. I don't know. What is it? Just don't... It's Ilsa. Oh, okay. I don't know how I feel about that. She's maybe one of the few characters who you could... Is, I mean, that's for anyone who doesn't know. Uh, Google Ilsa, She-Wolf of the SS. Um, she's a figure in a lot of Nazi exploitation movies. Um, there's been lots of crazy, weird iterations of her in popular culture. She's also based on a real human who is absolutely just Horrendous. fucking evil yeah. to her core. Um, and that's a part of intertextuality where it's like, I don't know if that works as well as the other characters because she is based on somebody who is real and truly awful. Or maybe that feels a little bit too real for me, but it's like, we don't learn anything about her. She's nothing. You know what I mean? Yeah. She's love interest to, to bad guy, to bad guy. Yeah. Who's been given immortality specifically so she can serve him for all of eternity. So everything about her is the aesthetic and just the fact of her being named Ilsa. Yeah. So, that I don't quite know the point of that, you know, and maybe you could, maybe makes me, I don't, I don't want to say uncomfortable, but it's like, you know, you do have to be more careful. I think if you're going to incorporate people who are real and then took on a life in popular culture, especially if they're terrible people, yes. you know, cause then you always run the risk of being flippant about well, that thing. And I think this movie, Del Toro is very sensitive to that sort of thing. And this entire movie is evidence of that, except that character doesn't get a moment, I think to really earn that a little bit. And to be fair, I don't think they ever call her by name. So yeah, you might not know they, unless you looked it up. Well, yeah, in the comics, um, we get like a whole Rasputin like thing of like how he slowly like came to rise to the ranks of origin the Nazi story. Yeah. yeah. And he was given a team of things. And yes, you have the assassin and you have her on that, but there's like a bunch of other characters and a lot of them are whimsical. Like you have a Nazi head in a jar who like rides around on a gorilla. Like it's, you have more ridiculous things. Apparently he like in Del Toro's musings for Hellboy three, that was going to be the villain in that is the Nazi head in a jar, which I would have loved to see a fun. Yeah, it could have been with lobster Jones. Yes. We also found out lobster Johnson, oh. um, that, uh, Oh, who's going to Bruce Campbell, Bruce Campbell is going to play lobster Johnson in the potential Hellboy three, which, Oh my God, I would have killed somebody to see that. And that means so nothing great. to me, but I love Bruce Campbell. Yeah. No. And I think he would be perfectly at home in these types of movies. When he, um, when you're playing the campiest character in a very campy yeah, like yeah. series already, like I'm so down for Bruce. Also Campbell. Bruce Campbell is just a really great actor. Yeah. You know, he also, like Ron Perlman in this movie, is somebody who can play a larger-than-life character and make it sell emotions for real. Uh, people don't fucking appreciate about that about him. And despite everybody loving him, I feel like he's never been given a really great opportunity to do stuff like that outside of things like Bubba Hotep, which that performance is fantastic. It is. Not a, not a lot of people talk about that movie much I feel anymore. like a lot of people do. Really? 
I've been hearing it a lot recently. I could use a few more, just though. Just in passing. I'm just saying. A few more might help. Yeah. I'd enjoy that. Um, but yes, we were just talking over the entire scene where this is one of the moments that the Liz character gets. Uh, yes. Not with Myers, because yeah. the, that's a moment you want to forget. What, what but, the fuck is... The, yeah, that, that's one thing I'll complain. Is like the, you know, everyone is fucking staring at each other at the end of that <laughs> scene, and I don't think I like it. That I seems like co- somebody fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> but... But I just don't like. Yeah, Liz the, gets that moment where she's passing. Yeah, but then we, you know, Myers, whatever. But yeah, the love triangle thing, which will come to a head later, sort of. What is the point of that? God damn it! Like that seems like another studio mandate. But I, yeah. you know, at the very least, this movie takes every opportunity to just dismiss Myers. Sometimes it shits in his mouth directly. <laughs> Other times it doesn't matter whether or not it's actually like landing on him yeah. because he's just nothing, you know, he's just nothing. And and even though he's nothing, the movie still uses that character to illustrate more interesting things about Hellboy. Again, the idea of being the guy who is the other and having to live with that and live in that uncertainty and ambiguity, you know, of how he's supposed to fit into things and uh, where he is supposed to fit in the world. That's the central theme of this movie, you know, uh, and, and I think even though that's a very generic, familiar idea, again, it's Del Toro's sincerity and commitment to doing that that makes it really interesting. And the way he incorporates intertextuality sort of adds, makes a rich sort of tapestry in how he explores that stuff. Uh, I, I, I just think a lot of what this movie does might sound obvious. Yeah. But when you really think about it, it's like it's doing all the obvious things, but not in obvious ways. It subverts <laughs> expectations, right? Just yeah. like good movies do. But it Just does like it in amazing movies do. But it does it in a real way. You know what yes. I mean? It's, it's not subverting expectations for the sake of doing it. Or, I mean, yes, we've said that. But yeah. like specifically, it's like here's a better way of putting it. It does all the straightforward things you might expect really strong movies to do that are made by not tour specifically, right? Except it earns all of them and it doesn't overstate any of it. Yeah. It's, it, it's because it earns it, you know? And that's the really interesting thing about this movie. Ra ra Rasputin. <laughs> How much of this actor's screen time is just him like mysteriously with his hands Posing folded? Yeah. Or being very self-serious. Yeah, I, I think Res, you know, unfortunately, uh, I think so far we've done a pretty good job of saying like, well, Hell Boy 2 did this better. Yeah. Um, but definitely big step up in the villain. Yeah. Uh, the prince is he's great. Great he's character. More, he's also slightly sympathetic because you kind of get where he's coming from. But like Rasputin is just like. Yes, he's evil magic man. It's like, what do you what do you want, Rasputin? He wants to destroy the world with the old gods because he's an insane H.P. Lovecraft cultist, basically. Yeah, um, I mean, he's kind of a nothing. He's a nothing character. I mean, uh, Rasputin, yes, he's a fun historical figure, but like a lot of the stuff about him has been blown out of context, obviously. Um, well, much like, you know, it takes on the popular culture. Yeah. Uh, you know... I was wondering about Life this of scene its own. where like these kids were already calling her a freak. Did she already burn things? Yeah. If she already burned things, then why in God's name is she allowed to go to public school? Or like, and, well, and also if she does, yeah. why the fuck would you throw rocks at her if you're a kid? Like, well, they, they're invincible or whatever. But my question was more like when we were watching that this was where I would get confused from the plot is like he knew about her. How? How did Rasputin... I know he can just walk in and out of shadows everywhere, but how? How did he know about her? He, he It's the throwaway line of, my master is calling your name and you have a greater destiny. Um, so, yeah. Or it's, it's because he knows about her because he needs Hellboy, and therefore he knows Hellboy's he needs situation. Hellboy. Yeah. Yeah. I guess that kind of makes sense. Maybe it could have been a little bit clearer, but it doesn't, it doesn't bog down the movie too much. Uh, this movie is definitely... It has a, f- you know, the fun, sort of irreverent pulp science fiction fantasy, uh, sort of plot, but it is more character, you know, and uh, that's a, an, again another thing that I think is more perfected in the second one is how the plot and the characters interact with one another. You don't get like something that's an excuse for really getting to know this Hellboy character 
and yeah. learning about him. It's like nothing in that movie is thrown to waste. That movie's excellent all around. By the way, if you look in the background behind Hellboy's uh, head right now, you will see a few uh, samurai swords. This yes. is interesting. Again, if we're going to talk about Guillermo del Toro, that's somebody who does real world building and character building visually. Some of you might have noticed that Hellboy does his hair in a specific style that is reminiscent of uh, samurai sort of hair buns or like knots, hair knots that they do. Top knot, yeah. Yeah, and I believe, I'm no expert on this, I believe from what I know that uh, samurais would do that because in their fucking big ass armor, it would get warm. Yeah. (laughs) So they would shave the top of their head and then just put their hair in a knot, right? And uh, this moment. The script says you are pure of heart, so (laughs) shut up. (laughs) I have just read the script. You are pure of heart. Or at the very least, we have to tell you you are and then send you to fucking Milwaukee <laughs> later. <laughs> yes, John, you're very good at your job. That's why we're sending you to the gateway to the underworld in Milwaukee. It's a hotbed <laughs> of demonic activity. There are Satanists in all the parks, and the cops can't handle it. Put a dollar in the red letter media jar. Yeah. Oh, my God. But yeah, no, I... We'll shit on Myers more later, but I do love the fact that the second movie has one throwaway line about what the fuck happened to Myers and then does not acknowledge him for the rest of the fucking film. Yeah. And again, we are shitting on Myers, but I definitely do not want anybody to forget the way in which, even though he's stupid and annoying, kind of, the movie, like, recruits that to help better examine Hellboy's experience in our lead characters. Right, because yeah. he does become the image of somebody who's kind of privileged and shitty in that specific way. And we didn't. Okay, this this is going to be a little bit of a personal thing. Okay, but like right now we have Liz, and she's sort of just in a depressive state. Yeah, because she had gone like, I think like we're assuming like several years or at least a year without an episode. Sure, to the point where like we're still keeping her in a mental hospital, but like she feels she's stable enough to start reentering the real world. Sure. And then she has an episode and destroys everything and fucks it all over. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I was like, we don't need Myers being like, come on, let's go back. Let's you're a fine person. Like, I don't know. As like, just on a personal thing, like as an epileptic, as somebody who like has episodes that can like, it, hurt myself and other people around me depending on the situation and like right. upend my entire life. I relate to that on a personal level. Like I totally get like the, Oh, I'm finally like over this. I'm finally like being able to move back in. I'm finally able to drive and get out in the world and then like have an episode and just like have all of that go up and smoke. Yeah. And, and yeah. I'm sure regardless of whether or not, you know, upon sec retrospect, like, Oh, my catastrophizing after like an episode is not, yeah, always exactly true, but that doesn't invalidate the like the emotional like struggle of having to deal with that. But to have somebody who's privileged yes. come in, in in that specifically privileged way, having it be a one sided conversation in that way, and, and sort of explain to you that you're like not he's not explained to her that she's better in that moment, yeah. but he is he is insisting. On, on a certain type of like social interaction between them that like assumes that she is not as necessarily traumatized as she is. He's making assumptions about her after not having like met her. Right. And knowing that she's completely vulnerable because of this thing that makes her different. And when he goes in there with like a specific unstated motive, it feels again, like privilege. And you it know, feels, and it feels exploitative because later we have them like going on the pseudo date and like we see him like trying to flirt with her. And this is the real thing why, why it feels like there's something missing with Selma Blair's character here is because just as there's multiple layers of irony and, and sort of both acceptance and frustration with Hellboy's character, you could maybe make the same argument for Liz's character where she gives him that look at the end of that scene, right? She doesn't actually fucking believe what she's saying. She knows yeah. better, right? But also, she, we know she wants to pass. She's very brutally honest about it to Hellboy, who, yeah. by the way, in that moment, at the very least, he doesn't respond possessively or like an asshole. No. He's just like, yeah, I got to go too. But he's hurt by it, but he's not a dick about it. 
Um, just another reason why Hellboy is just a wholesome, wholesome oh. good guy who's yeah. nice to everybody. And, and But Liz, when she's talking to Myers, you could also maybe see a desire for what he's saying to be true. Yeah. You know, she wants to pass. She wants to transition to something like that. She wants to go on dates to Starbucks. <laughs> yeah. You know, and have taking a Polaroid picture of somebody be like a fun, big deal thing that she can do and like just be with people, right? Yeah. Uh, but oh, that's <laughs> great, the fucking delivery. <laughs> that's just such perfect delivery. Anybody who wants to understand like comedy and, and the importance of playing it absolutely straight, just watch, watch that scene over and over again. Uh, and maybe that's an important thing to bring up too with Clay, who's another non-character, but is only defined through his hair plugs, right? Which I think we both agreed is something you could vaguely parallel to Hellboy with his, with his horns. horns. Yeah. Um, Artificially trying to assume some sort of normal look. Yes. To, for whatever reason, feel like you're better prepared to move through the accepted mainstream space. Obviously the consequences for Clay not quite the same no, as Hellboy. No, but it's supposed to, it, it's parallels. Yes. It's like, he just got hair, like, in the opening monologue, we have Hellboy shaving his horns and Clay delivering the yeah. thing of just like, oh, he does it to fit in. Yeah. Oh, look at them. It's not but, a coincidence. But then, like, yeah. Clay does the same thing. Instantly after that, he's yeah. just like, oh, you finally got the treatment? Uh, yeah. How's your hair doing? Also, again, another example of, on paper, something that is written and could be sarcastic and condescending. Yeah. Don't get that impression, actually. Ron Perlman actually seems to be a guy who's just like, you know, I want Clay to feel good about himself. I don't know about that far, but it definitely is like. He's not trying to upset him. No, but, you know, he, it's more of friendly banter. It's more of like, you said this about me, yeah. so I'm going to respond with a harmless jab back at you. That's like unequal footing. But I, I, I that's, never, we're splitting hairs here. Yeah. But he's definitely not being the sarcastic dick about it, you know? And the, the weird thing about that detail, too, is, again, it's it's like a double subversion. It's not the basic subversion of saying, oh, you know, the, the monstrous other is like us. What it's saying is, like, it's more making a point about his relation to Hellboy. It's like, oh, yes, we know Hellboy is different, but also that he's a human. But also look at how Clay, too, even though he's normal, can't overcome a certain level of bodily difference, even if it's a much smaller degree. And that's what's interesting because it makes it less about, you know, there being like straightforward perpetrators of a certain type of oppression or othering against our heroes. And it really does a good job of displacing it onto a world that both of these characters are born into and didn't choose. You know, Clay didn't choose a world where somebody, you know, a man without hair might be like shamed or something. Yeah. Right, even to that small degree, in much in the same way Hellboy didn't choose. So it makes it much more morally complicated and emotionally complicated. And that's just a fucking small detail. Yeah, which is what I love. Like, and, I'm partial because, like, I think I'm not to keep bringing up two, but like, two spends a lot of time developing Abe as a character. Yeah. To the point where he almost becomes the main character of the movie for a good chunk of it. Yeah. I would say it switches yeah. main characters, but Hellboy, like even then he's not my favorite character in the comics or the yeah, movie, but like he's inherently likable in all of them. Like no matter yes. what he's like a lot of these superhero type movies. And like, if we're going to bring it back to like one of the reasons we chose it is comparing it to modern superhero movies. All those, like the characters are, likable but they're very likable in a bland way like yeah it, it took them like it took them three movies to figure out what the fuck to do with chris hemsworth as thor before right. he was in a really good marvel movie like robert downey jr is playing the, the steve jobs cocky one man myth of just like oh i'm so smart and intelligent and i'm great at everything and cocky and know everything about it and captain america is the good boy but they're all very one note in that way well i think we're grasping at an idea that we're sort of formulating on the fly right now, which is the difference. Maybe it can also be connected to the difference between the movie telling you something yes. and a movie, not at all telling you something, but if you're actually bothering to look, you will see what is really going on. Exactly. Like, because it is still definitively in the movie. It's just not, it's not spoon fed to you. Like yes. the beginning of 
And we should clarify further, we are not talking about the difference between getting a fucking, like if you get a close up of something and it's very obvious with music, right? That is still more superficial than just having it in the shot and having it be something with performance. Yes. It doesn't have to just be explicit dialogue that is spoon feeding. There are other types of spoon feeding. But I was going to be talking about like, cause like uh, Captain America. Yes. The first one. We have so many scenes that show us and tell us over and over again before he gets turned into Captain America. Look how good of a person this guy is. Yes. Look how great he is. This is why he deserves to be Captain America because he's a good person. You don't get that in this movie, but you still get the same like emotional attachment and like us like realization of like how good of a person this literal devil looking thing right. is. And I'm so glad you made that comparison because now I think that's a better way to explain what I was just talking about all this time. Yeah. Right. So we get so many scenes in Captain America that tell us how good of a person he is. In this movie, on a certain level, as we're watching it we understand that these scenes are supposed to be telling us that he's that, you know, one half of the buddy cop who is brusque and too readily, you know, prone to violence or like dismiss of other people and condescending. Right. On a certain level, we know the scenes, we expect the scenes to be telling us this and it never actually tells us this. If we actually watch what we're seeing with our eyes, we just see somebody that's like sensitive and playful and fun. Yeah. And that allows the performance to take over. You know? Yes, completely. It This is definitely what we're talking about when we say the movie earns it. You know, it's maybe hard to define at first because it is, it feels so similar to other things, but it's very different still, you know? And by the way, uh, we totally blew past what might be my favorite set in the movie because as we've discussed just in life, I don't know on the show yet, but like any any movie could use like some hidden creepy room that's like in a basement and oh didn't yeah know it was there i forgot you loved that yeah. so much go for it yeah or just like anything that has like a giant fucking flame furnace in it is just great i love that uh well yeah you were talking about it's reminiscent of an inferno yeah anything like that you've got a hidden thing under a thing in your basement uh us has that a little bit i don't yeah. know if you've seen it yet uh it's i love things like that because it's just really neat again it's like a weird part hiding under normal reality, just like this hidden history, right? And that's a good point to segue into something that we totally could have been talking about this entire time with Gabe swimming through the tunnels and then being in the sewer is a big part of this of Del Toro's awareness and sensitivity to Hellboy's experience as others, well, all our monstrous heroes as others, is his awareness of how they operate in marginalized spaces, sort of on the edge of mainstream society. Yes. That's a big part of not necessarily a big part, but it's a notable thing that pops up frequently in this movie where what do we see? What is our technical first introduction of Hellboy outside the prologue is him on TV. It's news. It's a big thing when he's, when he leaves the marginalized space and refuses to make himself invisible anymore. You know? Yeah. We have dark, yeah, we have dark underground places. So that like, are away from the public eye. And I was talking about yesterday, like it's good for both driving home the metaphor of the others and marginalized groups that monsters are clearly supposed to represent to a degree in this movie. And also it's a good thing to tie into the fairy tale and myths that a lot yes. of this stuff is because what's the best modern equivalent we have to dark caves and tunnels and whatnot that you would have in old fairy tales yeah. that we don't have a lot of anymore. It's definitely subway tunnels. It definitely, and it helps with the, with it establishing that sort of pulp science fiction tone because you really do get like that type of mythologizing going on in real time with this yeah. where, you know, it does, it feels like it abstracts all these different spaces, right? To a certain extent, just a little bit, but also when it does that, it focuses you to it allows you to focus more on like the meaning of these settings when these characters are going through them. And again, something that Hellboy 2 takes to an even further degree, where it takes that idea of marginalized spaces and outright turns it into an examination of colonialism and just trampling over other spaces to make way for mainstream society and the conflict that exists because of that and how that becomes a generational conflict. Oh, that movie is so beautiful. Yeah, it is. Uh, 
Um, but that's still something that's going on in this movie, you know? Again, another reason why we've discussed this, another reason why I think I enjoyed this movie more this time is because I realized that this movie put all those foundations in place. Uh, it's not jumping to something totally different. As much as we love the set design in this movie. Yes. It does even better than the second one. Also, what, what is this blue? A quick thing for the <laughs> for this scene, though. Uh, this shot was shot on Doug Jones's birthday. Yeah. And they had him so long in the tank on a harness in there that he apparently like had bleeding in his cr- like crotch region. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just like a miserable birthday for him. But apparently, I hope that's not the end of the story. Well, no, but <laughs> I know that Del Toro will come up that morning with just like, "Hey, Doug, how's it going? <laughs> Happy birthday! We're gonna be hanging you by your balls all day." <laughs> Why did they have to hang him by his balls? Well, it's a joke. It's a crowd oh. harness, but I guess it's the only yeah. way they could do it. Yeah, well, because he has prosthetics on everything yeah. else, so you would see it anywhere besides oh. his trunks. Oh, you. Yeah. And this is, again, to compare this to Men in Black, like, this is the first time, by the way, that 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 really Hellboy is passive-aggressive or anything. Mm-hmm. Which, not passive-aggressive, really, because it's fucking entirely justified. Yeah. He's being racist and terrible. Like, Yeah. And, again, to compare that to Men in Black, Jeffrey Tambor's, like, little, like, fucking self-righteous monologue at... At, at, at fucking uh, Hellboy, there is almost l- not literally, but it's very, very similar to what Tommy Lee Jones says to Will Smith, right? Which that alone should tell you something about the racism of Men in Black yeah. that you can fucking compare him discussing to a literal, like literally, physically not a human, even if in his status as an identity, we can all acknowledge that Hellboy is a real person, but. The fact that in Hellboy, they treat Will Smith like he's a fucking alien yeah. and that he has special access to the alien or not Hellboy in Men in Black, like he has special access to the fucking aliens because he's not what? Because he's not white? Because he's not, <laughs> not he's, he's Tommy young, Lee Jones? He's a young with it cop. He'll understand aliens better because what the fuck? Like, Rip Torn literally says he has a problem with authority. Oh, what good kitties. And, it, you know, it, it is just a little bit annoying here where even though we see Hellboy not being an asshole before, it feels like there's a shift in terms of his vulnerability. Now, he feels more willing to make himself vulnerable at this point to us and to Myers. Yeah. But then immediately Myers takes the fucking high road. In well, I think huge fucking quotes because he's on a good he's on good terms with Myers right now because he was a little suspicious before. But Myers did bring her back. So, like, he's just like, oh, okay, good. Everything's going great. Now I just need to, like, show her how I really feel. But then Myers does start encroaching in on his, like, I know, like, that scene in a different movie would just be, like, the paranoid, like, oh, look, he's being overly jealous and it's going to fuck up his chances. Impossessive, yeah. But no, Myers has no reason to, like, go on a genuine date with, like, I get, like, the whole, like, trying to like oh let's get liz out it's good for her it'll be good to be in the real world it's good for her recovery right but don't like flirt with her well on that exercise this is the thing by the way that's probably the worst moment of cgi in this movie yeah fortunately it's two seconds um but the the part of that too is since it earns this like interesting layers of that performance and ron perlman's performance this far i think you can read a lot of things into it where he immediately, when he becomes suspicious of Myers, you see a lot more of that instead of it just being stupid possessiveness, despite it all still being possessive. Right. Yeah. Because it still is. Um, he's reading things into Myers out of a more sincere concern for Liz. Like I see things in his response to that, that are more like, Oh, Myers didn't fucking even care about bringing her back at all. You know, Myers just want to get in her pants. Yeah. But also, like, it's what... It it is his, like, actual, like, respect for Liz as a human being and not something that he possesses that makes it a conflict for him, right? Now, he's not a perfect character. (laughs) No. So he still spies on them, right? But the fact that he is having that conflict is, again, 
not something that I think is like the conflict of possessiveness in a normal love triangle. It's more him trying to like just another way to square like his relationship to being not normal. And he's having an internal debate with himself on the rooftop. Right. Like in the scene coming up. Um, And yet again, like in a different movie, this would just be like Myers being like, well, I'm using my, PTSD training that I learned at the academy to try to help this girl out and like help right. her misinterpret that for a date and wacky hijinks would ensue. But no, it's just, we it's, never get the benefit of the doubt that Myers isn't just trying to do that, you know? And he yeah. doesn't have an actual relationship with her. You know what I mean? No, and he, it's doubly suspicious because supposedly he's like confounded and baffled when he first meets Abe and Hellboy. Yeah. Right. And despite the fact that she can pass, she is also occupying that unstable, unstable identity as a monstrous other. Right. Of course, when he meets her and re- responds to her, it's all about, you know, it's just you mean a taxi like regular folks or like, how about we just go get a cup of coffee like normal people? Yeah. Like a normal person would do. Right. Because the fact that she physically is not signifying her difference in a straightforward way, like Hellboy or Abe, the fact that that makes all the difference in Myers' interactions with her just further cements how, like, privileged and shitty he is. Yeah. Well, also, we have, like, this, like, where he's he says the same line over and over again, but, like, each time is a different meeting. Where he's just like the first time it's like, oh, I've lost. Like, he took her picture. And then it's just like the second one of just like, oh, well, he took her picture does it really matter and then it's like the third one is actually anger like right he's going through three different emotions by saying the same line and like it's hard to do that with yet again in a normal scene never mind with pounds of makeup on top of your face well just you could say that about almost every moment no it's interesting you bring that up too because i'm realizing right we would have to go back and see this but we're talking about like oh the pictures that liz took that were on her wall at the at the uh, ward right yes her room I, i don't think we see one of hellboy but you see one of Broom. Yes. Right? And obviously, maybe if you went back, you could see one of like Hellboy's tail in the background, and that's his picture of him. I don't yeah. know. I'm just spitballing. Right? But clearly, the picture thing is important, but also that has to do with bodily difference. Yes. Right? Uh, and the fact that Hellboy wants to be seen. You know what I mean? This is his whole thing, is that he wants to go, he wants to be allowed to be in these public spaces and recognized. Right? right. This is his angst in these movies. This is why Jeffrey Tambor is like fucking shitting all over him all the time. Yeah. Right. Because despite him being the best at his job. Yes. And despite him being like, I mean, just the fact of it being racist to begin with, but like he wants to be recognized in the, in a mainstream way and not be forced to live underground on the periphery in these marginalized spaces. Right. And the photograph feels like a way of, of being recognized in a certain sense sense right yeah. so in a certain in a way even when he is acting like possessive of liz and like spying on them he is still responding with frustration and anger at, at something greater than liz he doesn't like displace responsibility for what she does onto liz no you he know never blames liz whatsoever or hold her choices against her he's just trying to like work through it yeah. right so the possessiveness is again despite being a cliche is earned. I feel in this movie because he is genuinely committed to having this character try to figure it out in on terms that are not like toxic yes, or dehumanizing the list. It's interesting, right? They don't look like spies. Are you kidding me? Oh, I don't know who this kid is, if he's just like some producer's kid or whatever. But He's Macaulay Colgan. I do like him. He's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this is this is the sort of, this is the nail in the coffin. This is like the really dude. Yeah, really Myers? She literally just Well, as we know, none of those people died in no, that hospital. No. It was a miracle. <laughs> um But she caused lots of property damage. You yes. gotta feel bad about that. Also, I know we've been shitting on Myers, but I do think the actor, whether he was aware of it or not, gives a good performance playing into that, where he uh, is I just guess. a hapless privileged guy. And I think that comes out in the comment. I mean, it's not exactly funny, but in the way he reacts after getting hit, 
he just sounds like a privileged guy who's like, who did that? How you dare know? you? Something about the way he does it is very, uh, I don't know, very white. Also, or like entitled. I was. I brought this way. up yesterday, but the "We'll Meet Again" music playing in the background yeah. is a little on the nose. But why? Because he met Rasputin. Yeah. Well, it's like the beginning of this story started with him encountering Rasputin. Yes, Rasputin and the goons, and then yeah, the end of his story is well, gonna... also like we discussed too. It's not like that's all it does. You can't use that song in movies without it being now something that's reminiscent of Dr. Strange love. Very true. Um, uh, once a movie does something with a piece of pop culture like that, that is so definitive and like perfect every time after that, that it's used, it can't be separated from that, you know? Um, and that still works with this movie, like a sense of apocalypse, you know? Yeah. Um, but also a sense of apocalypse that, you know, is, is done mutually by two sides. Again, if we're going to talk about, the the way in which the discomfort of what the Nazis are doing and that initial link between the Christianity and the Nazi cult, right, plays out more in the scene where he actually thanks Broom for raising him, right? The idea that Broom could not change the like the inherent and amb- like unsafeness and ambiguity of the world that he's bringing Hellboy into. You know what I mean? And the fact that we are not inherently like that, like safe from the evil that the Nazis represent. Right. And that it still exists in the world in us still. Right. That is something that I think comes home here where it's like, you can't, I don't know. You can't, you can't stop that type of, evil because it's still present in this society. Yes. And then one thing I, we also talked about just a little detail again, talking about like little shout outs or like references or sketches of different things that Guillermo works into these, that clockwork Nazi soldier guy, very creepy yes. to me when I was a kid watching this. Um, but interesting that we get that moment where we talk about him a little bit because he's also a non-character. But interestingly enough, there's way more to him than Rasputin or Ilsa. Yeah. Um, and it's all in that scene with John Hurt. And actually, I would say that's probably a reference or just an, a, an idea for a character that Del Toro is drawing from uh, a story by E.T.A. Hoffman who sort of invented in literature, a type of idea as we know it today of like automatons, right. And like the artificial automaton human, um, and playing into that as like the ultimate embodiment of like a hollowed out husk. Yes. Who is totally regulated. Right. It's yeah, no, it's that is a, that's an amazing way of thinking about it. Well, this is the same thing. We've, we talked about it too, with like the idea of the way Fritz Lang uses clocks. Yeah. By the way, something else del toro has learned from right uh machinery clockwork these are images of rules regulations uh structure right these are iron bound structures that work together to tell you the time right yeah um and the interesting thing about that is when you sort of imbue that with a character that becomes a trait that can communicate something about a character being like dominated by like Reg, like regulating ideology, right? It's like this character is not an individual, but their ideology that's totally puppeteering them, right? Well, yeah, what did he say when he was giving the autopsy of him of just like what kind of vile drive could keep the... <laughs> yeah, because he has no blood. Yes. He's just sand, he's empty. And he says like, what sort of horrible will? Yeah. And it's like, yes, that character is pure ideology. In fact, doesn't he say when he sees him coming down the thing, he's like, I see the puppet. Yeah, but where's the puppeteer? Right, he's empty. And I, you know, it, it's not like that he, that character fits into some grand scheme of like reading the subtext of that movie, this movie in some sort of way. Yeah. But the fact that he builds, that's world building, right? The little wind up shit that he does. The fact that it's also has a subtextual idea within it and it's not just a cool aesthetic. That is the world building again. Uh, Gil- Del Toro is good at this. He's good at the world building. Uh, and he's drawing from a whole lineage of different writers, right? In doing that. Uh, I don't know if that character was big in the comic book or what his role was really. No, he had pretty much the a similar role. 
I right. Think he, I think he might have come back at some point just as a like small little thing, but like not no, he's not like more developed as much. Yeah. I mean, let's let's face it, that character looks really cool, but let's compare him to another really cool character who is technically a nothing character, the most famous one. Do you know who it is? You do. Think about it. Don't do this to me, because I'm never thinking of the same movie that you are. It's Boba Fett. Oh, yes. That, right? Yes. This character, way more thought is put into the way this character looks and behaves than Boba Fett. Yeah, Boba Fett was more just like... Even though Boba Fett works in his first introduction, yeah. right? Immediately after Empire Strikes Back, he's there for aesthetic alone, and he loses his, like, interestingness, right? Uh He's interesting purely for aesthetic reasons, mostly in Empire Strike Backs, but he also earns that like badass nature by being clever and smart. And the fact that he looks cool is kind of a plus. Whereas the clockwork soldier in this, like everything about the way he's designed, he behaves, and just who his history as a character feeds into his image, you know? Even though he's still a nothing character. Yeah. It's great. Aww. Speaking Abe. of Star Wars, Abe, you're such a good boy. Still can't understand why they put those <laughs> blue things on the side. <laughs> I can't imagine a doctor trying to read that and be like, well, we got to wait for it to come back around. <laughs> Sorry, I missed your diagnosis. Yeah. This Rasputin character. The fuck? How are you the head of a paranormal division? Well, here's and the I've never heard of Rasputin. Here's the other interesting thing about that that I realized when we were doing the prep screening. Jeffrey Tambor is so dismissive of all of this, right? And it's very easy for him to be a cartoon character. But even that scene, I think, is an interesting choice where he's dismissive of him, where he's just so dismissive of all these people in general that there's no way he could ever appreciate the gravity of the work that they're doing. Yes. And it's interesting because it's sort of like people who who might point out to like it's like a middleman thing yeah almost like with the nazis and to be or not to be i feel like because it reminds me of people who uh those those privileged people who think that people who are part of a marginalized com- community are always making things about race about the fact that they're gay et cetera, et cetera. right they always this is the the response right Stop making it about the fact that you're this, right? Because it makes me uncomfortable or whatever. And they dismiss it as like a personality thing or like these people being weird, right? Or yeah. just like you people have to just learn to get with the program. And but that's what Jeffrey Tambor does. I want I want two things for this moment. Okay, yeah. Because this is an important This is a big moment. character moment. Yeah, okay. Well, one cute bit of trivia. I'll always look this good. Del Toro said that to his wife. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And uh, two, this whole moment, this sums up in a very literal and like on the nose way. What we've been talking about is the whole relationship between Liz, the outside world, Hellboy, the outside world and each other, where it's like, listen, I know that the reason that like you're not completely comfortable being with me is that like I'm a constant reminder to you that I'm that you're also the other. Right. And also I'm restricting in your ability to pass as somebody who's quote unquote normal. And the fact that you can't quite participate in space the same way with me. But let's just revel in being weirdos together. Like, I, I I love that. And, and, And it reflects back on, again, his response to Liz going on that date with Myers in the first place where you can then reflect on it. And it's like, Oh, again, he's not necessarily in that moment mad because she gets to be normal and he doesn't. Yes. You know, it's not about him in the same way. He's just trying to find find a place for himself without hurting anybody else and looking after the people he has relationships with. And he doesn't he's not solipsistic, you know? And here we are. Ra ra Rasputin. Another interesting way in which, you know, we compare this to Men in Black, and I think I think one thing we haven't we've sort of been talking about a lot is how this movie earns things and is smart uh in subverting your your expectations in a in a genuine way. Um but one thing you might also compare this to is like X-Men too, 
and I'm saying in a way that makes this look more favorable, where X-Men tries to be more strictly allegorical, I think, right? To the point where in uh, X-Men, the uh, children, daycare, young children. (laughs) What's the one? Which one? Young boys. They are X-Men. Days of Future Past? No. The oh, one before first that. First class. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Young <it's>, boys. <laughs> well, I was thinking like I was school wonder, I was, children. I like, was wondering if you were talking about like in X2 when we see like the smaller children going to Charles Xavier's school. Like I, I had no idea what you were talking about. Right. I'm sorry. No. I don't know the X-Men. <laughs> but point is like in that one, there's literally a line where a guy says like, oh, you didn't ask, so I didn't tell. Mm. And that's stupid. <laughs> uh, that's dumb. And the other interesting thing about this is that this movie doesn't quite try to be semi-allegorical in that way, in a way that like restricts meaning. Because again, that's what that's doing, right? That's restricting the subtext to a very specific thing. Instead, Del Toro just tries to conceive of these characters and it's like, no, these characters just would be experiencing this in reality, right? It's it's less that it's trying to be allegorical and more that it's, it's saying that it's recognizing those things in these characters' emotional experience. Maybe that's in the comic book, too, to a certain extent. I imagine it would be. Um, oh, God, he needs a Snickers. <laughs> Again, somebody called the ad agency, told them to get the Snickers people on the phone. Uh, they got another uh, product placement for Jeffrey Tambor this standing actually, in front of a grave. This whole corpse thing, this is a, there's, it's just a Hellboy short story where he has to like rebury a body in the proper grave, and the body's like mouthing off and being an asshole the entire time and del toro just liked that story so he decided to work it into the movie which i love yeah and, and like you told me before we started he also does the voice for yvonne there yes for yvonne del toro does yeah we he, should say he does the voice for a bunch of small minor characters in this which is fun but uh again before i got sidetracked about x-men what i was gonna say the interesting thing about it comparing this to men in black is again uh you know, if you, I think it's wrong to look at this allegorically because I, I don't think it's really even attempting to do like a thing where it's like actually making a statement about this, right? Yeah. Well, like in the way X Men is. X Men, yes, is very like that's why X Men has been able to stay relevant over the years. It's like it was a metaphor for civil rights back when it was created, and then in the '90s when it started to get more popular again. Right. It was a metaphor for gay rights, and I think that's kind of why it still works to this day is like you can put whatever group is currently right. The marginalized thing rewrite a little bit of the characters and it still works perfectly. But what this movie does differently is that it does not try to connect it to an actual marginalized community. It invents these, this yes. community as a marginalized community. And it says the language of marginal marginalization and the means of marginalizing a community are not quite so different from one community to the next. It will pick something. The mainstream culture will pick something and use it to disenfranchise people, right? Uh, And you can find all sorts of similarities, right? It's not hard. Uh, And this movie, I think, again, it's that's an important but subtle distinction, right? Where it is not trying to artificially create that connection, even if that connection makes sense, right? I think X-Men, those movies, when they do that, that adds value to it. That's interesting to me. Yes. That's why, for a long time, I've appreciated X-Men movies more than other Marvel movies, But that also puts a cap on the ceiling of what I think that movie might be able to to achieve, uh, or at least what I might expect a good version of that movie to achieve. Whereas this, because it is not quite so concerned with trying to have some sort of allegorical uh, sort of uh, correlation in reality, and it just shows these characters existing as marginalized in a marginalized community, it allows it to flesh out more about that i think you know yeah it's like the difference between closing down potential subtext to a specific thing so you can make a point about something and then taking a story and sort of uh adding the subtext as a foundation that can be built in all sorts of different directions you know yeah so it's subtle but interesting difference that i think is worth worth examining because I think, you know, this type of movie does it in a way that I think leaves a stronger impression with me, despite the fact that I like some of those X-Men movies, you know? Yeah. I would, I, I legitimately, I was better off dead. (laughs) Um, 
Well, is he going to die when he goes to the bottom of that? I don't think so. <laughs> oh, shit. At least until the charm wears off. Oh, that's awful. Why are you grabbing my boob, Jeffrey Tambor? <laughs> I mean, come on. Look at Hellboy. Oh, well, we didn't mention that, too, during the big romance scene. We had a thorough conversation about this, but oh, Guillermo God. del Toro really does specialize in making movies that are, like, rule 34 friendly. <laughs> We will say he he is the premier monster fucker in Hollywood. He, yeah, not that that's like we're not saying that's bad. By no the way, listen. In fact, we would you, say that's probably more interesting. Yes, if you like to fuck monsters, uh, this is the podcast for you. Yeah, Del Toro does not hold sexuality against anybody. No, but it is like just an interesting, funny thing to notice. Uh, you know. Because you know somebody wrote a fanfic about Hellboy and his fucking fist. Yeah. Who wouldn't want that though? I yeah. mean I mean, if we're gonna be literal, I mean the I shape, the Shape of Water is literally a movie about fucking a monster, but Oh, here we are. And it makes me you maybe you could retroactively think something about Abe Sapien. Yeah. What was he thinking this entire time <laughs> when he's looking at Abe? Oh, good job, Jeffrey. You fucking useless piece of shit. <laughs> you just fucking human blob again clockwork imagery why wouldn't you just leave him here he's not like an active combat agent he's like the bureaucratic head of the thing because he's useless and will get lost you know what i'm just noticing too we were talking about the clockwork we've got gears everywhere there's fucking clocks on all the tables right yeah he's listening to a vinyl record more circular imagery right and more there, see, there's a clock in the background. There's multiple clocks. That's deliberate. And again, not, not the last time he would associate a, a fascist evil character with clocks. In fact, his very next movie, the main antagonist, would be obsessed with clocks. Yeah. That's something he does. And it works. It makes sense as an image. I, need to re- I haven't seen Pan's Labyrinth in too, too long. I adore that movie. I need to rewatch it. There isn't like, I don't think I'd go out of my way to watch Crimson Peak if somebody put it on. I'd rewatch it, but like there are very few Del Toro movies that like I won't rewatch at some point. They're all like, you know, I think Crimson Crimson Peak tries a little too hard for something that it doesn't achieve. Yeah, but it does have really fantastic performances, specifically by Jessica Chastain, who has I've never been more scared of a woman scraping butter onto bread <laughs> than of her in that movie. It's quite quite phenomenal, <laughs> but uh, I think that movie's interesting. I was a little bit underwhelmed by it at the time. It's interesting. I'm just saying, like, out of all of his movies. Oh, man. Like, Could we I... maybe read something into that? The fact that Jeffrey Tambor distracts him by throwing a gear at his head. We have this character who's so associated with gears, right? But Jeffrey Tambor, in his own way, is associated with gears and machinery. He's the representation of this bureaucracy, right? Yeah. And the fact that Hellboy himself is going to drop this giant fucking gear in this guy. Pinhead. I also, etymologically, I'm not sure if Cronin is similar to another word that might no. mean something. I, I, I love this. And, and like, yes, he's a caricature, and like this kind of goes away in the second movie. Right. But like he still that, gets something, even if they're it's just, they're recognizing each other. Yeah. Okay, we both serve a purpose. It's the only way they can. Yeah. And maybe that's enough for this movie. Yeah. In terms of this, when we don't know if we're going to get a sequel to this film. Although I will say in terms of character stuff, this, this, the most stupid this movie gets is uh, with Jeffrey Tambor after he gets his arm slashed. He goes, what's wrong with you? <laughs> it's like, I laugh yes. every time that stupid line happens. Though. It's like, yes, we know he's stupid. <laughs> It's a little bit more. I think I know exactly what's wrong with him, Jeffrey. You don't think you know what's wrong with him? But yes. So another interesting thing, we were t- comparing this to Men in Black. I, yeah. I think I started saying this earlier, and we, we started talking about allegory because the point I was going to get into... Oh, oh God, God, Myers, you're so shitty. Interesting, they also blue. have a blue guy. So she could have said red, white, and blue. Yeah. But... uh. Well, I think Abe is supposed to be like, he's almost, he's a little bit different. Yeah. Abe. 
Like in this movie, he kind of just plays like an asexual best friend of like. I mean, after Shape of Water, we definitely know that he has a penis in this. Yeah. <laughs> but that's even without the existence of a Hellboy 2. Oh, no, more eggs. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, what I was going to say again is uh, what this the way in which the, these characters are portrayed reminds me a little bit of, like, the experience of, like, immigrants in a way that was interesting, in a way that we found was, like, sh- like depicted in a shitty way in Men in Black. Specifically the idea that, like, no matter how much Hellboy contributes to this society or how long he's been living there, because let's remember he's lived there since... How long? He would be a member of what? The greatest generation? Yeah. Or would he be because since he was like technically quote unquote born in 1943, would you say he's an early baby boomer? Yeah. But then the movie goes on the way of just saying like he doesn't age the same way we do. He's just like right. 29, but, 30 or something. Like, but technically, yeah. generationally, he's a baby boomer. He's when, like kind he, of right. He's a he, yeah. Well, he's both. He's like a baby boomer and I guess Gen, yeah, Gen X as well. He's like a weird combination of both. But it's like, it, it, it's this interesting thing where despite how long or how thoroughly yeah. he tries to integrate into the society, the society would never allow him to actually become a native of America. Yeah. L- or let me phrase that better in a uh, way that's like the, not confusing. Of the population. like He would not be accepted or presumed to be... Uh, in big quotes, authentic American, which yes. again, we're, we're saying here because he does not fit the, the white heteronormative image of that. Right. And that's something that I think is, is specifically more related to, um, an experience of like immigrant families, you know, when they come over. Right. But as long as you are not white in this very specific prescribed way, you, you do not, get to reach that status of being the authentic American, no matter how long you're here. Yes. So you're like, you're marginalized doubly, you know, because you totally belong in America at this point. Why would you run toward but, the area? She's going to shoot fire. Okay. Whatever, buddy. You I'm know, not- he just, he's just useless all around. He hit Liz. Cool. That's almost the only thing he's good for. <laughs> Does he actually solve any fucking problems in this? Legitimate question. Does he uh, confront any bad guys or do anything like that? Uh, he kind of help, helps Hellboy in the first fight with the Hellhound. Like, he distracts him long enough with shooting him, even though Hellboy refuses to acknowledge it because we're setting up for something that doesn't happen. Yeah. Or like you were talking about the buddy cop thing. But aside should... from that, I don't think he does anything. No, not really. He's just there for the ride. And I'm totally okay with that because, again, this movie, in a very clever and I think creative way, uses that to its advantage. Uh, you know, he doesn't really have a place fighting these demons, right? No. But also he seems too privileged to really, like, find a way to fully support our monstrous heroes as they do it. See, if we focused more on my... I'm trying to think of, like, how he could work as a character. If we focused more on him and then, like... He replaced um, Arrested Development guy. Tambor? Yeah, as like the middleman between the FBI and the Paranormal Bureau by the end of the film. Oh, I, that's maybe weird. He's he's not being sent as a new recruit, but he is fresh out of the academy. Yeah. But he's like, they have great expectations of him, so he's immediately thrust into a role he didn't fucking deserve in the first place. And his privilege is like, very, very central in that case, you know, and not something that he just reveals through behavior, but literally becomes a plot point. Right. So what if it's like this weird nepotism thing? Yeah. He's like a waspy guy. His family has worked in government, et cetera, et cetera. But he's kind of the black sheep of the family. So like <laughs> he gets a good, he gets a good position, but it's in this shitty organization that nobody else wants to be a part of. But, but then by the end of it, he learns from these people and he actually becomes a good head. Or something to that nature. Yeah. At, like, I feel like he can't truly be a black sheep because otherwise he's too close to to being far, well, we like don't, far away we from don't being ha- the authority. We don't have to know that at the beginning, but like that's sure. how we can learn how to relate to the characters by the end of it. 
and again, much in the same way that this movie does the thing with Clay, you could make him sort of uh, an outcast in a specific way where it's like, it also reflects on his inability to be the normative image that his family or where he comes from expects him to be. Yeah. Right. Um, so it winds up saying something less about him inherently, but also the circumstances in which he is born into that he cannot change, but he can learn to live with and change in the future. Yeah. Also interesting, the degree of clockwork imagery in this church here. I am utterly at a loss to what any of that could fucking be doing. Oh, no, it's just the window into Nazi gear, yeah, Nazi gear man's room. Yeah. They're just like, did you really have to put all of that stuff next to our demon summoning room? And it's just like, oh, sorry. I guess so. I didn't choose rooms. But it is interesting how that imagery then, you know, meets in the middle yeah. around an even larger circle, which I'm guessing is some sort of saint or Catholic figure. Right. Again, that almost com- looks like Baphomet to a degree, but I can't really see something exactly. mystical or spiritual. Yeah. Right. But again, it, it, it's reinforcing that idea between the uncomfortable link, right. Of that spirituality and then the evil system and machine that can take over and how those two things exist on a spectrum with one another and they're not safe or separate. I know we were a little bit confused about the plot of uh, this. I'm not. I was, I I guess I just missed a little bit that like he, this was their plan all along or he drew them there. I know that he wants Hellboy. He, that's the whole point is that all of this was a slow thing to get Hellboy to here so he could use him for the ritual to summon the old God into the world. Cause that was his purpose His the right, the stone hand on his right arm is a key to the evil, dark Cthulhu Lovecraft dimension. Yes. And he's going to bring his gods there. That much is clear. Yeah. Uh, I guess I was just a little bit confused about like they know to go to this place because or like, well, Rasputin, or, or the fact that Rasputin, Rasputin tricked was, them into getting yeah. these clues. Well, Rasputin was buried here. So I'm assuming that because he's an immortal, whatever, he's had time to set up the conditions for the ritual or, or whatever. And it works here. But yeah, so... He's had quite a while. That's okay, though. Th- again, this movie, the plot is not the primary draw for me in this movie. It's the characters. And again, just another interesting way of exploring this idea and, and Hellboy's monstrosity is is the like literal importance of his body in the plot. Yeah. The, like, it, here's a little thought experiment for you. If you cut off his arm, would it still do the same thing? What do you mean? Do you think Rasputin could cut off his arm and then without Hellboy's volition? And I'm saying, forget for a second your this comic. thought experiment, right? Yeah. Forget comic book lore or anything like that. Could Rasputin cut off his arm and make him jam it into the thing, uh, not in a Rule 34 way, but to complete his plan sort of way? I mean, squids, right? Maybe his ultimate plan is the Rule 34 thing. We don't know yeah. what he wants, Right. Rasputin, we know, is a sexual maniac. Yes, which this movie kind of glosses over. Yeah, so those tentacles, watch out. That's what I'm saying. What do you think he was doing with those monsters? I thought you were going for a serious place with this, so I was like genuinely starting to no, listen. No, I, I was, and then I thought of that, and I'm like, that is too stupid not to say. <laughs> so I said it, and now it's over. Oh, no, the moon is gone. Fuck. Yeah, but um, but what was I saying? Oh, was- if you cut off his arm and he had him put it into that thing, could he also not... Could he just do that? I don't think so. I think it has to be like volitional. We see like the fire crown appear above his head and like his it's horns basically grow back. It's like yeah. some sort of demonic energy he has or something. Going back to the beginning of the movie, the question yeah. of what makes a man, he has to accept a part of himself that is yes. is uh is, is the part. evil, you know, the ultimate sign of the other. These these eldritch gods from HP Lovecraft's nightmares. Um but it is interesting to me just the, the like the sheer fact of how important just a part of his body is, you know? Yeah. It's like his arm is weirdly like a MacGuffin in a weird way. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. But like that's like beside like the horns and the arm are like the most othering thing about him though. Yeah. And it's like we need you to really embrace that the most important part about you is your arm. You know what I mean? So even to Rasputin and these guys 
it's like the important thing is like a part of his body and that's how they define him in relation to who he actually is. They're like, we know your true name. You're, you're, yeah. you're a demon, you're a monster. Which we actually don't, we don't learn his true name until near the end of the second movie in an offhand comment. Like, Doesn't a similar thing happen? Because he also, because of his quote unquote true identity, his demon identity, he has the right to challenge. Yeah, he's like, he's the son of basically, well, in the comics, he's, ba- he's literally the son of the devil. But like, cool in like this yeah he's the son of a high demon so he does have like demonic royalty so yeah he has the right to challenge uh the prince at the end of the second movie but yeah i like the fact because like they keep on oh do you want to know your true name do you want to know like that and he keeps rejecting that every character rejects it and i like that this movie doesn't cave in and it's just like oh your true name is um yeah um, you pronounce it like somebody from lord of the rings <laughs> did you ever notice that where it's like wait a second what is that word i was always confused by that as a kid despite loving those movies it's like are you saying mordor and they're like we must go to mordor mordor it's like okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> i know it's a big deal guys but Wardor. Um but uh but yes, what the fuck were we talking about? Oh yeah, the fact of his body being an important thing and that shift too. Uh very familiar cliche moment, right? But the fact that Myers throws the thing at him and we have so little reason to be invested in anything that comes out of Myers' mouth still manages to make it more interesting when he decides, no, I'm not gonna do this. Yeah. Right. You know, he's always looking for ways to try to assert himself, right? Whether it's in the mainstream space, he tries to it attempts to assert himself just by refusing to be entirely invisible in that space. Whereas in this situation, he once again refuses to be reduced to just his body parts, right? What he looks like on the outside, whether yeah. it's whether it's him on the outside like what makes him different and freakish makes him useful or it makes him othered. He doesn't want to be judged for that regardless. He wants to make his own destiny. Right. Or simply the fact that it's not necessarily less dehumanizing to him yeah, than to, what he's done. Yeah. And it, it is interesting too, to just think about the way Myers says, remember who you are. Like Myers fucking knows what that is. Yeah. Fuck you Myers. When the lion leaves Myers, mouth, it's a cliche, but I think when it, when he hears it, it's way more interesting because Myers thinks he's saying a certain thing where he's like, I know who you are. You're a good person. Right. But that's actually not true. And I think what occurs to Hellboy in that moment is regardless of what the fuck Myers thinks, I am my own person, despite whether or not he knows that. Right. Or what he thinks that person is. Yeah. And he will never know what that person is, but I am my own person. I don't have to do this if I don't want to. And that's interesting to me. <laughs> Again, it's all sewn together by the performance. Yes. Maybe some people will think we're being hyperbolic, but I would encourage you to revisit this movie with all that in mind. It's definitely worth it. Honestly, like I, I know we're not doing a double feature today, but I would be okay of just like immediately jumping into Hellboy two. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, we should definitely do Hellboy two. Um, Maybe a bit in the future, but like I, I would love yeah. to do it soon. I'm sure there's been plenty of criticism written in an interesting way on Hellboy 2. It really does lend itself to that. Yeah, like, and, and sort of reflecting on like the fact of colonialism existing in this world as well, Yeah, in this space with these mon- monsters. And also, if we're going to be comparing this to like regular comic book movies, like Hellboy doesn't avoid all of the tropes. Like we do have a dumb fight sequence with a big CGI thing at the end of it. Like, I think it's less that it's CGI in that Rasputin was like just a non character to begin with. Yeah. And now we're fighting just a squid that we have no relationship (laughs) with. It's like, what does this monster mean to me? Yeah. I don't know. Like I get it. These were like some of the things that we were stopping from coming in from the other world. And one got through because it was living in Rasputin, but like, yeah, but it's not like, Oh, it's the squid that I've been waiting for. (laughs) Right? Yeah. It's like, I don't know anything about the squid. Not the squid. You're a kid now. You're a squid now. Just have the Splatoon theme song play constantly. Another weird parallel to Men in Black. 
Yeah. Literally get like get swallowed by their larger get swallowed, opponent. Get covered in goop. And the hero is fine. Except in this movie it makes sense. Because he's fireproof. So I'll accept that he's not hurt by the explosion. Whereas the other guy not getting digested in Men in Black, I'm kind of like, what? Okay. Whatever. And again, I think it's uh it's interesting to me too if we compare that to the Samael fight. Yeah. And also think of it in terms of rep, uh like comparison to Men in Black as well. Again, just talking about like the way Hellboy engages with his adversaries is so vastly different than in Men in Black where they're police. Yes. They are police and they're the worst they're the worst like most frightening image of the police. Right? They regulate things without actual like credential authority. They're powered purely by their ideology, and that gives them authority over other people. <laughs> it's very frightening, that movie, in a weird way. Whereas Hellboy, even in that final fight, it's not like he he went after that, them. You know what I mean? In both situations, the bad guy takes the girl, which is kind of unfortunate. Yeah. But in this one, he goes after the girl and not there to exterminate the bug. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, and also, like... He's more there because he cares about Liz. And, like, it's not like they're going out. He takes Liz, like, while they're on an operation together as operatives, not like... Yes, she's part of the team. Yeah, it's not like he took her from the BRPD when he killed Professor Broom. Yeah. He's like, now you have to follow me to Moscow. It's like, no, Liz, she had a part to play. She was, like, in the absurd amount of energy they needed to open the portal or whatever. Like, right. And it's interesting to me because, God, it's just so, it just reveals so much about the difference in approach between like filmmakers. And it's not like talented people didn't work on Men in Black. It's just a subtle like change in like attitude is, it goes a long way, I think. Yeah. And um, also I feel genuine romance in here rather than like the weird, disgusting sexualization that happened in Men in Black for whatever reason. I mean, that just makes no sense. Yeah. The weird like, I mean, that character is a, is a sex object 100%, yeah. but it's, uh, it, it's played for laughs in a weird way that is like, what the fuck is wrong with this weird sociopathic movie? Um, and here's Sad Sack Myers. A friend of mine once wondered. You knew him for like three days, dude. Yeah. Everything about you is just annoying. I don't know how you... I think Myers now is really like, oh, it's probably a good idea. I didn't get to even first base with him. <laughs> <laughs> I might have died. I do think it's funny that the final image of this movie is the awkward fade out. He's just third wheeling it so hard. <laughs> He's third wheeling it as hard as anybody ever has. I am surprised the movie ends that way. And it's not just like, cause yet again, if Myers was an actual character, it would end with like either him, like as like a higher position in the bureau, like filling in Dr. Broom's shoes or like leaving but like having a new lease on life after yep, having learned but there's something. just nothing about no. him. Yeah. And, uh, it's weird to have a, a character that's such a, like an annoyance, but have it not reflect on my attitude towards the movie. Yeah. Like I greatly enjoy that he's an annoyance and he's annoying to me in a way that is like, is really like, I mean, that shit is fucking annoying in a way that Jar Jar Binks is not annoying. <laughs> You know what I mean? Because Jar Jar Binks isn't goddamn real. <laughs> That's true. Myers is a real person you interact with probably every day. Very true. You know? And that gets under your skin in a new way. And uh, the fact that this movie is able to balance that, where Myers still feels shoed, like shoehorned into this, but that it makes that work somehow? <laughs> that's so weird. That makes no sense. But that's like... I think that's like a real achievement. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I'm sure there's plenty more we could talk about just because Doug Jones gets eighth billing. Come on, buddy. Well, Brian Steele, I guess he gets it before John Hurt, which is surprising, but, um, John Hurt gets the tasteful and yes. credit though. That's a, I feel like that's its own yeah. thing, you know? Um, Rick Baker. Yep. Applause to Rick Baker. Uh, but again, you know, I feel like we could say a, a lot more about this movie just because there's so much care put into those details and because Del Toro is a guy who I think is not always successful at doing th this, 
but he does really strive to make those cohesive within a story and have it have a point. There's, I don't want to say there's like an infinite like game thing going on in this movie where, you know, there's so many interesting images sort of kiss. Oh, what is this? It's a post Marvel, a mid credit scene. They forgot him in the catacombs. Yeah. I'm going to say not as good as the, uh, scene right before the credits in blade two. Did you, did I tell you about this? I forget. Okay. Where blade spares a vampire at the beginning of the movie. And then he goes free throughout the entire movie. And then at the end, he's going to like, some weird like stripping show or something. Oh yeah. The, and then he turns out the light and blades in there. And he's like, you didn't think I ever forgot about you. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> I like Wesley Snipes in those movies. Yeah. And that's the last thing I have to say about Hellboy. <laughs> um, no, no, but no, good movie. Good movie. Um, I think in this oversaturated era that we live in of superhero, superhero yeah. movies, this one stands out as just like a genuinely touching and well thought out and, genuinely enjoyable film um if you're a comic book fan check it out if you just like i don't know i I, it's hard to like add and if you like this and if you like this i know like the title of hellboy and the concept might turn some people off but like there's not many people i wouldn't recommend this to it's a pretty accessible movie yeah and at the same time i think it's way more actually like genuinely interested in the emotional experience of these characters than a film like men in black might be, but well, almost yeah. any superhero type movie like this. Yeah. You know, like it's trying to create a situation where the characters can speak for themselves instead of trying to fit them into plot points. And it still puts them in that sort of progression of that recognizable familiar plot, but it sort of breathes and is it's its own thing in a way that is interesting and refreshing. Yeah. I, you know, yeah, and good movie. Good, good movie. movie. I I do really appreciate this movie, and I'm glad you chose it because I really feel like I took away something new from watching this movie this time, and it makes me. I mean, I did order uh, uh, the Golden Army. Yeah, the second one. Yeah, because I saw it on sale, right? And I'm like, I'm just gonna fucking buy that, and I ordered that earlier this week. And uh, I'm really glad I own that one now, too, because that's even better than this. I actually only own Hellboy 2. I do not <laughs> own Hellboy 1. Yeah, that's so. that's fair enough. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you made this decision. Oh, I'm glad that you enjoyed it, and I'm glad that you actually took away something uh, new from it. <laughs> yeah, you never know when you're doing a show like this whether or not returning to something you haven't seen in a while you're going to maybe find less to talk about with it or more or even within that whether the things you find to talk about are good or bad. Yes. I think that was very much the experience for like men in black for yeah. me, where it was the opposite thing of like, I had an indifferent opinion on men in black and then I came out of it with a much more negative one, but way more to say about it. Yeah. Yeah. Very true. So yeah, I, I would hope that anybody who maybe hasn't visited this movie in a while, um, sort of watch it with fresh eyes. Maybe, maybe the, the way that del Toro treats these characters is more apparent to people who wouldn't necessarily look for these sort of things in our post Trump world where just things are more, or at least seem more awful, not necessarily that they are more, more awful than they ever were. Everything's awful. Yeah. But you know, data wrangler, I'm sorry. I just saw a credit. There, oh, there was another, wrangler. there was another visual effects credit for a uh, cis Hollywood, which what was weird? To, never mind. But this anyway. is what happens when we yeah, talk. For too we've long. been talking for too long. We're nearly at the end <laughs> of the credits, everyone. So, so, so yes, uh, watch this movie again. You can find us on spectatorfilmpodcast.com. We have episodes available on iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher, and we have social media accounts uh, on most places. And by that, I mean only three: uh, Twitter, Instagram, and. Uh, t- uh, we're theoretically Tum- still Tumblr. We're, yes, we're on Tumblr. Yeah. Uh, I always forget about that one. Um, so yeah, you can message us or do anything really. Let us know. Comment comment on one of those if you have an idea for a movie you'd like to hear us talk about. We'll take it into yeah. consideration. Much like Hellboy, we'd like to get noticed by the public <laughs> just to make sure that we know that we're like still exist and aren't like Bruce Willis at and the also end of Sixth Sense. Also, we'd like to know that we're not going to horrify anybody who sees us. So yeah. There's that. Anyway, bye, everyone. All right. Bye, people.